Number 10, knocker upper. All right, it sounds a little different than its actual purpose. Hear me out. Alarm clocks, they're not great, right? They suck, no doubt about it. Now take the alarm clock and assign that job to a real life person. What does that look like? What does that sound like, rather? at 6 a.m. That person is called a knocker-upper, a person employed solely to wake up workers at mills and factories on those early morning shifts. Now, going from house to house, using a long pole to knock on bedroom windows, that sounds like the best job ever, right? I can't close the list with this one. This is number 10, for sure, it's kind of fun. If you had this job, well, you're probably not alive anymore. I don't know, unless you live in a weird town. The people at the time were a lot friendlier back then than they are now, so, you know, I'm sure the knocker upper came around today, It'd be a little different. They'd probably be on World Star the next day. Knocker uppers back in the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for waking me up. I would have lost $14. Thank you. It was a big deal. It was definitely a big deal. Number nine, World War One. This is considered to be the end of the Victorian era, and it makes sense, especially the first half of the war. It was a mixture of old world versus new world. Horses and cavalry swords versus Germans in trenches with large rapid fire blam blams. In Great Britain and of course other European nations, they were foaming at the mouth to attack each other. However, culturally speaking, they were the same since Victoria had passed. Not much had changed. However, after her passing, and of course after the war, big changes, huge changes. So much so that it changed the world and in different ways in different countries. We need a whole list to go over that, but empires fell, America got rich, and they went back fighting shortly 20 years later. It was kind of awkward. Number eight, stiff photographs. For some strange reason, people in the Victoria era were like the grandfathers of all goth kids. Any obsession people have today with the strange and unnatural, well, you can partially thank the Victorians. A good example of their obsession with the weird and oddities is post-mortem photographs. Yikes, yes. Given that photographs were a new and amazing technology, and for the time, yeah, they were. And that people had some less than living relatives lying about, well, it only made sense to capture their memory forever by having their picture taken. Dressed up, prepared, and positioned in many different ways just to bring the mantle by the fireplace together as what would a home be without the post-mortem photographs of your old Aunt Burge? Am I right or am I right? It's weird, I don't know. Number seven, grave robbing. If ladies of the evening and cold-blooded de-lifing have always been a part of life, then so it was grave robbing. The second someone was buried with anything valuable, there's been a creepier person on standby with a shovel. That's just how it goes. Poor Dompe from Zelda. Guy gets a bad rap. This was no different in Victorian times. However, while digging up corpses for baubles and trinkets was certainly done, there was a far more lucrative business, especially for those in the mad scientist business. <laughs> Sorry. People were paid under the coroner's table to dig up cadavers and retrieve them for doctors and medical professionals to conduct all sorts of freaky deaky stuff. Mostly just to learn, but you can be sure someone got a little weird with it. We always do, we always take it too far. Number six, Christmas fire. One of the things my mama always taught me was fire safety. My dad taught me how to deal with a bonfire after 10 beer, but well, mom's lesson was safer. Never leave the stove unattended. Put candles out when you're done and know your fire escape plan. You gotta know it, you never know. While this event may seem like a wholesome family fun on the holidays, I get anxiety just thinking about it. In Victorian times, families will play a game at Christmas called Snapdragon. You get a large dish or bowl or cauldron, I guess, large enough for everyone to gather around the table and fill it with a whole bottle of brandy. Then pour in some dates and large raisins. Then ignite said brandy ablaze and try to grab the blue flaming dates without getting burned. Folks, this is a time before modern firefighting techniques, burn medicine, and houses are just really close together. So one good fire could take down a whole block, maybe a city. Not a good idea, don't do this, don't recommend. Look, Mom, I got the flaming raisins, now the curtains are on fire, wow! Number five, the potato famine. Potatoes have been a staple of many cultures' cuisines for centuries, partially because of their ruggedness, easy to grow attitude, and not only filling, but very delicious. Ooh, let me some fries. Good box of hot fries and some salt, baby. Let's go. Well, 1845 Ireland was a wee bit different as a fungus outbreak was taking hold of the mighty potato harvest all over the country, thus creating a large famine that would see one million people or more perish in a large famine. Queen Victoria tried to help, but was extremely ineffective, and by help, 
Well, I mean the same effort I put into reading books assigned to me in high school. Sorry, Miss Middleton, I used Cliff Notes. I'm sorry, I did. I used, I'm sorry, I love you, Miss Middleton, you're the best. But I read like 10 pages out of the book, so that's gotta count for something, right? Right? Number four, the Napoleonic Wars. Like World War I, this time can be stretched to include Victorian England. Why is this event so dark? Well, because Napoleon wasn't going to stop. France had recently discovered what freedom was, and sacre bleu, it tastes amazing. <laughs> and they overthrew their government. Napoleon surprised everyone by being an amazing general. Dude took on multiple nations at once and won multiple times. It's extremely impressive. However, in a classic case of went to his head, he became the leader of France and declared himself the first consul of France, or emperor in other terms, and started stripping away rights, especially from women, which sucks, like a construction worker who kicks off his boots at 5 p.m. I know you're out there, you guys just, you just kick them off. Just get rid of them, those boots, they're stinking. He invaded other European nations and was on a path to destruction until the international community put, him to, put, put a stop to it. They said no more, dude. Number three, dirty. It's dirty, isn't it? Oh, it's dirty. It should be noted that the streets of Victorian London were not clean at all. Maybe the filthiest, maybe the filthiest ever. It was so bad that in 1858, the Great Stink occurred, which basically was all the refuse and filth piling up in the River Thames. Combined with a heat wave in the summer, the issue had literally been mounting for years and now would come to an offensive bubbling over. Oh, that must be awful. The smell was so bad it was making people sick, and people were most likely getting sick from the river from cholera outbreaks. God, that's disgusting. Cholera was more common than you'd like to think. It took some serious engineering and a lot of pumps to fix the sewage issue that was severely outdated. It wasn't fully fixed until 1875. Keep me soap when you're hand sanitizing here, my folks. It's gonna be a little greasy. Number two, lots of arsenic. We of course have to mention a big problem in the 1800s. Arsenic, everywhere, all at once, okay? Skin lotion, tons of cosmetics, it was a nightmare. Even if you didn't use any facial cream or anything, it was everywhere else. It was in wallpaper, it was in dresses, it was in toys, medicine. My gosh, it really was horrible, it's a nightmare. And it's because arsenic was cheap at the time. It was during the Industrial Revolution. It was being unearthed more and more, and finally, come 1851, the Arsenic Act was past which fixed a lot of issues. Yeah, we regulated that one not soon enough, but we definitely got that one fast. And finally, number one, Jack the Ripper. Unidentified to this day, we've gotta end on a horrific note. Everybody's just finding out now about Jeffrey Dahmer, it seems, he's a hot topic on Netflix. But what about Jack the Ripper? How did he get away with it this entire time? Why aren't we going to see a Netflix doc on him? Ever. Jack the Ripper was active in the East London neighborhoods, primarily targeting workers in the area. Now, at the time, the murders of five women from August to November of 1888 were believed to have been connected somehow to Jack the Ripper, although some sources claim that he was active even until 1891. Again, we're never going to know at this point. Many believe Jack the Ripper had some anatomical knowledge due to the way that he left his victims. I can't really say anything else because it's disgusting, but yeah, he knew some things, disgustingly. And while there were some suspects, including a member of the British royal family, believe it or not, Jack the Ripper was still never identified. Number 10, the fuzzy wonder. Growing up, I had the classic red toy car. It was great. I would honk the horn, slam the door with attitude, wearing a diaper. It was the perfect invention for a youngin like me. But back in the Victorian era, the toys or whatever, not as fun. Definitely not as fun. Fisher Price wasn't born yet, so if you wanted to wheel around and kill time, maybe even have a few laughs, well, you had to use this. The Fuzzy Wonder. Yeah, this, uh, let's unpack this one, shall we? This patent, I'll be honest, this patent here makes me think. It makes me wonder more than anything. Why didn't this change history? Are you kidding me? The fuzzy seat, the gears, the foot straps, the possibilities are endless with the Fuzzy Wonder. The only thing that we do know about this patent, the only hint as to who or what this was for, is written right below the product's name. It says, the Fuzzy Wonder, the champion of his species. His species? You're telling me there's more of these? Where's the fuzzy champion? Let's take him for a spin. He's probably got an engine. It's probably great. I go shopping, riding one of these for sure. Definitely wheeling around, throwing stuff in. Easy. Number nine, chimney sweep. I remember when I was younger, I had to sweep the chimney in the house every now and then, whatever. And I personally, I loved it. You know, I thought I was the father of the house for a bit, getting in the chimney, getting all dirty and stuff, doing this, my hands on my 
on my waist. I don't know, it's, that's, that's what a man was when I was younger. That little broom too, I love that little broom. I remember when I would do this, my grandmother, who is very English, she would be shook. She would watch the entire time. She would be taken back into time because this was a terrible job to have in Victorian London. I was, yeah, it was not the same at all. Chimney sweeps were famously young. I can't say anything else there in regards, but yeah, they were we lads, to say the least. History is horrible. 1840 was a good year, all things considered, because the law was passed that then made it illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to climb in and then clean a chimney. Thank, thank God, I'm glad that stopped. I was 18 cleaning my chimney. I had no idea I could have used this great law. Been like, actually, mother, a lot of claws. Number eight, funeral mute. Funerals suck, man. I was a pallbearer like three times before the age of 21. My one arm is just strong as fuck now, that's it. I can lift anything just with one arm. I thought being a pallbearer had a lot of pressure, right? Victorian London saw many, many funeral mutes. Oliver Twist, one of those lousy jobs in that tale was that of a funeral mute. Funeral mutes were required to dress in all black with a sash while carrying a long cloth covered stick and your job would essentially be to stand and mourn silently at the door of the recently deceased home. Yeah, guy dies of a plague and you're like standing there like holding your breath like great, this is the worst job ever. You would then lead the coffin to the graveyard. So a lot of responsibility. Yeah, don't trip or breathe. Number seven, toilet troubles. Now, the Victorian era was unsanitary, to say the least, but it was also dangerous in ways that you wouldn't expect, right? Go to the bathroom and may not come out. One of the greatest Victorian inventions was that of the bathroom, but it took a few tries to figure out the whole, you know, methane gas problem. We gotta really deal with that one first and foremost. Spontaneous combustion of the bathroom was weirdly common. This would, uh, this is how, every time you take a shit, you were worried that you might just Woo! That was horrible, that's so scary. Flammable gases like methane and hydrogen sulfide, they would build up over time with human waste. Human, a, a, a lot of human waste. Built up in the sewers and then eventually would back up into your homes. Next thing you know, you're lighting a candle and your bathroom's gone. Just like that. Now we have poopery. You know what that is? You ever see a little spray? After you go, you just, you hide what you've done with one little spray at your friend's house. It's fascinating how far we've come. Number six, stairs. Yeah, believe it or not, stairs were a common danger in Victorian times. I'm somebody personally who falls up and down stairs a lot. I'm 6'2", I'm lanky as shit. I have like a Gumby body. I walk around like Woody. I'm always falling up and down stuff. It's horrible, especially in Canada. It's so slippery. I'm always, always slipping all the time. In Victorian times, I would have been doomed. Houses were thrown up comedically fast. There wasn't a Mike Holmes on Holmes to come in and check it out. There wasn't a building inspector that made things, you know, safe. Servant staircases, they were tiny. They were out of sight. They were built built into these narrow walls, often missing steps that they had to and cut corners just to, you know, be narrow and out of the way. That plus a tray of hot soup and a lot of clothing, yeah, it was next to impossible to move around without something happening. A lot of fatalities and staircases. Even today, around 12,000 people die each year falling downstairs. Hold on to that railing. I'm here to remind you to hold on to that railing. It's crazy. There's actually no stairs there. I just made that whole thing up. Hit that like button for magic. Number five. Burke and Hare. Medical schools were offering a handsome fee for deceased bodies to study. This was, this is an odd time. So an unhealthy amount of Victorians came up with this new solution. They thought they were brilliant. Yeah, they would rob graves. They would just go and rob the freshest graves they could find. They would wait in the bushes until the funeral's over and then they'd go and Disgusting. It got so out of hand that family members were actually guarding the graves of recently deceased overnight. That's how bad it got. That's disgusting. But nobody goes down in history like William Burke and William Hare. They were an unlikely duo, to say the least. They wouldn't wait until the body was done living. You know what I mean? They would actually kill people and rush the process, all for a pretty penny. 16 victims in total between 1827 and 1828. It took 16 victims for people to start catching on to this weird plan. The pair would lose victims into their house, fill them with alcohol, and then they would suffocate them. They had a sick system and they would suffocate them because the body needed to be in the best condition possible in order to receive a payout from the Edinburgh University Medical School. So they would, you know, try and keep it as clean as possible, which is horrible to say, but it makes sense. The Anatomy Act in 1832 put an end to this horrific plan. Number four, bird hats. Look, I don't have much to say about this next one here because, well, 
All right, yeah, I love a good hat. I've worn a few hats here throughout my time on Bumblebee, some baseball caps, some beanies here and there, sure. I've never worn a dead bird on my hat though, and I don't think that I will, that's for certain. I might just leave that out. Taxidermy was a hot topic back in Victorian London. Folks would rock the dead beaver or bowler hat, any animal they would just prop up there, and it was considered fashion at the time, believe it or not. It was a dangerous trend though, long-term. Conservationists were saying that 67,000 species of birds were all at risk of extinction due to this crazy dead bird hat craze. Can you imagine just a stuffed seagull on my hat? I'm like, all right, number five, here we go. It's crazy. Also, that's like a lot of weight, you know what I mean? A lot of weight on your head, just kind of, oh sorry, there's just a dead pigeon on my head, so my neck's kind of sore. What if the wings opened up and you kind of just like got some air? Maybe that's why they did it. Number three, holiday cards. Today, these Hallmark holiday cards, they go way too hard. And they also have a card for everyone and everything, you name it. Birthdays, weddings, stepdad's name day, you're like, what? That's so specific. Like, they have everything covered. But back in the 1800s, these holiday cards, they were brand new. Nobody knew what to write or say, so they would just end up sending these artistic sentimental scenes. It would be like a frog in a top hat riding a bike. No caption, just that. You'd be like, hey, Merry Christmas, I guess. It'd be like a carrot with a face. It'd be a haunting image, really, to receive from a loved one on Christmas, but it's the thought that counts, I guess. This holiday season, just give your parents a card with this on it, and then see what they do. Don't even write anything. Just stare at them in the corner, all Victorian-like, and be like, Mother, father, Merry Fortnite Christmas. I don't know what they would say. Number two, ladies of the evening. Oh yes, the streets of Victorian England were filthy, all right. And if every street corner was a lovely lass for lowing her dress in hopes of luring in a customer, as they say, oh yes. She shan't have to wait long, as this type of business was more common and profitable back then than you'd really like to think. Personally, I don't see why it is illegal or still is, especially if it becomes regulated. I mean, why not? Let, let them do what you gotta do. However, it was bad. There was a lot of sickness and bedroom related sicknesses. It wasn't good, it was horrible. I just fell off the box. Sorry, I'm an idiot. Number one, Jack the Ripper. Oh. Not much I can say about this guy that YouTube won't let me say, so here we go. The first serial unaliver to do what they do in the pale moonlight. The streets of Victorian London were crowded, dirty, like I said, and oftentimes chaotic. So for a true psychopath like Jack to exist only makes sense. He was kind of a ghost. He was responsible for the passing of several women who worked the streets and, uh, well, they were really violent crimes. We can't show you, but we'll show you a picture of Jack in a cloak or something, maybe in the moonlight or something like that. The worst part is he was never caught, like ever. Not, they, we don't, we never got him. Or he was a she, or he was multiple people. We, we just don't know, there's many theories, but because of technology at the time and, and crime solving things, we just, we just didn't, we, we didn't get him. Kick it off the list at number 10, Smokey Behind. When somebody tells you that you're just blowing smoke, it means that you're lying, okay? You've now been given exaggerated information of sorts. Well, back in the 18th century, they literally had to blow tobacco smoke at your Behind, yeah, weirdest work break ever, I'd say. So why did we perform magician enemas back in the day? What was the deal here? Well, tobacco smoke enemas were used to treat quite a few symptoms, or they thought so, including a common cold. These enemas came in these fancy kits with a fancy rubber tube. It was all fancy because it was an honest medical practice at the time. It was done by legit medical practitioners. This is the funniest part. The idea was that the tobacco smoke could warm up a soon to be deceased body. The nicotine would stimulate your adrenal glands, jolting you back into good health. The best health, might we say. And the way they would do it in the mid 1800s was by just blowing smoke and just waiting, seeing what happened. We're figuratively and literally blowing smoke. That's the origin of that saying, fun fact there. Imagine doing that today. Like, eh, I think I dislocated my shoulder. What do I do? He's like, eh, one sec. Number nine, saved by the bell. I'm sure you've heard about this at some point, but allow me to go into grim detail. In the late 1700s, cholera, bacterial infections, everything bad, you name it, it was all spreading. Not an ideal time to be alive. Many were biting the bullet at this time, of course being gravely ill, but with this came a dark trend, the safety coffin. Yeah, we got a safety, we had the safety dance, now we got the safety coffin, here we go. These coffins, I mean, God forbid you were buried alive, these safety coffins would allow the dead to rise again and exit said coffin. A lot of these coffins have extra comfort on the inside and of course, a wire. This wire ran through the coffin, through the ground and attached to a bell on the outside. So if a passerby or heard it, 
one, that would be so scary. But if they heard it, they would know something's up and they would help them out. Folks would get creative with their safety coffins. For example, a man named Robert Robinson from Manchester, he passed in 1791, but he instructed his family and watchmen to open the special door on his casket, revealing a layer of glass. Now, if anybody were to see condensation, he could then be removed. Patent number 81,437. It was actually granted to Franz Vester in 1868. It was an approved burial case, a real patent. This was a real coffin. This is crazy. This one had an air inlet, a ladder, and a bell. All three, there you go. The description of the patent says, if too weak to ascend by the ladder, he could ring the bell, giving the desired alarm for help, and thus save himself from premature death by being buried alive. Nice. You thought you died. Psych, climb this ladder. There you go. Good luck getting out. Now you're in an escape room. Enjoy. You only get two hints. Like a little walkie talkie. Hey, uh, how do I get out of the coffin in room B? Number eight, no air. Now that song's gonna be stuck in your head. Jordan Sparks, a classic. Since we're on the topic of safety coffins, I had to include one more. Maybe two more, I'll never tell. This one is fascinating. The science involved here was honestly impressive. There was the classic wire and bell method, but the more sick people got, the more creative they had to become. Like for example, patent number 268,693, John Krishbaum's device for indicating life in buried persons. Yeah, an 1882 classic, we love this. We got the iPod Nano, they got the device O-Life. Nice. Upon first glance, you may think this is some type of medieval punishment, whatever, but really this device detects movement whilst providing much needed air. Now you obviously can't have a hole in the ground or else rats will make your real demise much worse than suffocating, right? So John's device here, as per the disclosure details, is that if the person buried should come to life, a motion of his hands will turn the branches of the T-shaped pipe upon or near which his hands are placed. A marked scale on the side of the top indicates movement of the T and air will then pass come down the pipe. Once sufficient time has passed to assure the person is dead, the device can be removed. Yeah, imagine waking up with this in your hands. I wouldn't be calm enough to turn it and then breathe in a passive amount of air. No way, there's nothing passive about waking up in a coffin. Number seven, bad hair day. Okay, you want it messed up? Let's do messed up. Hope you're not eating any food right now, especially not eating in the dark. Two red flags. Okay, the Liverpool Daily Post back in 1869 had readers invested on this fateful day. Right on the cover it read, a 30 year old passed away in the village of Lincolnshire. Now at the time, that's not far off from average life expectancy in the 1800s. But this case was odd. Everyone wanted to read about this. This case was noteworthy. It was important that folks understood what took this young lady's life. Doctors asked the family if they can carry out a post-mortem and lo and behold, they found a two pound solid chunk of hair sitting in her stomach. Two pounds. That's what happened. That's how she met her fate. That's horrible. This ball of hair caused an ulceration of the stomach and ultimately caused her death. The woman's sister did note that over the last dozen years or so, she had casually been eating her own hair. So at this time I say, if you know anybody eating hair, send them this link. It's not a good idea. Cut that out. Stop doing that. Number six, the Great Famine. Weird time to talk about a famine after the hair incident, but okay, here we go. Back in 1845, a potato crop that a lot of the Irish population relied on was no longer available. This was huge. This is bad history right here. A group of microorganisms wiped them all out and in result, around 1 million folks died or had to leave. It was draconian law at this point and British ruling that made the exported food hard to reach people. This famine led to Irish independence and anti-union movements. Historical, definitely. Messed up, absolutely. Number five, Queen Victoria's name change. Every year on May 2-4, we set off fireworks, then we have way too many hot dogs. It's the best. We call it Victoria Day, right? It's for sure called Victoria Day, right? Well, back in 1819, Victoria was christened in an almost private ceremony. It was small, obviously. Victoria's uncle only let a few people attend. Like I mentioned in part one, she had an isolated childhood with the whole Kensington system. That was no way to live. But even the day she was christened, trouble awaited. Her name was Alexandrina Victoria, and at the time, the name Victoria was not regal. It was a French origin, almost an odd name to have at the time, so she was immediately advised to change her name to something more traditional. But as our calendars can definitely confirm, she said, nope, I'm good. Victoria Day, yeah, it's definitely Victoria Day. Number four, tattoos. I only have the one tattoo, but I've always wanted more. Just not so good with needles, you know? I got my eyebrow pierced and I fainted. It's a fun fact, I have a little scar there. 
not great with needles. Some of the designs are so beautiful on tattoos, the amount of pain you all sit through, I'm impressed, honestly, mad respect. The tattoo craze really took off once Queen Victoria's son, the Prince of Wales, he went and visited Jerusalem. And of course he saw copious amounts of body art and was inspired. Inspired, we'll say, yeah. So upon his return, he was all about ink at this point. And the Prince of Wales, well, if he has a sleeve, well, then maybe I can have a sleeve, right? What's going on? It wasn't a sleeve, really. It was a cross. The prince got a tattoo of a cross in homage to the Crusades. So if you're going to try and convince your parents to let you get a tattoo, just, you know, tell them the Prince of Wales did, right? You're just trying to be a royal. Number three, gym day. Believe it or not, they were around 200 gyms across Europe during Victorian times. Yeah, just like six good lives. So you're like, what? What's this about? Even Victorian dudes skip leg day. How great is that? Okay, it's not just you. These gyms weren't bright, they weren't open, they weren't well ventilated, they weren't motivating, and definitely not safe. None of those. Definitely not. No, Victorian gyms were reserved for the upper class, obviously. Grab your pocket watch and blazer, Ezekiel. We're doing squats today. These machines also were not ideal. They were designed as antiques first rather than their purpose. Also, half of these look like saw traps. Like, are you kidding me? No way I'd bend my arm around any of these devices. No way. All those wooden wheels? No. I'll stay weak and brittle. Thank you. Number two, ghost photography. How to look back. I don't like talking about ghosts. As if the reanimated corpses coming back to life while they were ringing a bell wasn't scary enough. Yeah, let's talk about 1800s ghost photography. The camera was a hot new invention at this time, so tales of ghosts and spirits were now easily believed. Yeah, obviously, when you have a photo of a see-through woman, you're like, I, that must be, that's pretty terrifying. A big name in the ghost game was a man named William Thomas Stead. He was born in 1849 and Stead was the son of a Congregationalist minister and at the age of 22 he was appointed as editor of Northern Echo, which was a regional newspaper in Darlington. So far, so good. This British medium, Richard Borsonal, featured a photo of W.T. Stead and a real spirit. Yeah, imagine that. Imagine a day where somebody being awarded the Nobel Peace Prize also poses for photo ops with ghosts. You're like, I don't, do we believe all of this or none of this? What's going on? This is so scary. And finally, number one, music for eternity. Before we wrap up this wild part two, I had to include perhaps one of the creepiest patents of all time. Patent numero 9,222,059. Yeah, the number is going a little bit higher. This one got me thinking. I wanted to end this video off on this note. I like this idea. Maybe, I don't know yet. Music for Eternity Systems. Okay, this patent is not from the 1800s, but rather 2015. I know, it's not Victorian, but when else am I gonna talk about this, really? The idea here is that you could stay connected to your loved one by using a solar-powered digital music player. The best part here is the patent details how surviving family members now have the ability to update, revise, and edit stored audio files and programming after burial. Yeah, next Rihanna album, no problem, I got you. There's a speaker in the casket and there's a headphone jack on the tombstone, so we can listen together. Kicking off the list at number 10, dark dining. I don't know about you, but I can't eat in the dark. I need to see every single bite that I'm eating, okay? Call me crazy. Part of me wants to go to a restaurant where you can't see anything, but I know that I won't make it all the way through. I can't do it. I like, I have a thing. I have to just, I'm not blindly, what if it's not cooked? I don't know. Back in the Victorian era, dining in complete darkness wasn't just a date night. It was actually the best way to digest, or so they thought. That's why many Victorian era homes had their dining rooms set up in their basement. How random is that? Oh, do you guys have poker nights down here? Nah, just brunch. Kill the light. <laughs> what? How do you like your eggs? Turn off the light. <laughs> what are we doing? Number nine, alarm clocks. While the medical world was one threat in Victorian times, apparently so was the technological side. Who knew? We obviously didn't have reliable alarm clocks back in the 1800s, obviously, but we did have jobs. So in order to get up on time, lamp lighters or knockers would come by and tip you off. Yeah, they would just yell in your window and just alarm. That's how you'd wake up. A man would yell into your window and smack you with a stick. Legend has it a young man named Sam Wardell, he got a little creative with his wake up calls. He needed more than a lamp lighter at 5 a.m. So he would Tony Stark this alarm clock gadget. He would use wires, a bunch of stones, all that unsafe stuff. Then at a certain time, stones would fall to the ground, of course, waking him up and presumably everyone else in the building. That would be alarming. Well, Christmas Eve, 1885, tragedy unfolded. A few friends had come over for a holiday visit, so Sam had to move some furniture around, rightfully so, to make room for, you know, windmills and break dancing, whatever they did in Victorian Christmas times. The next morning, he forgot to put things back in the small apartment, and the obvious happened. The rocks then fell on him while he was asleep. Yeah, that probably doesn't feel too good. I thought iPhone alarms were jarring. 
I take back everything I've ever said. Number eight, relaxative. Okay, so right off the bat, the Victorian era was a little messy. I'm sure you've gathered this by now here on Bumblebee. But these messy new illnesses were putting lots of pressure on medical practitioners, so they were desperate for these new treatments. We laugh at Victorian medical treatments, but they tried, okay? They at least tried. They also achieved many medical breakthroughs as well. But when it comes to handling chicken pox in the Victorian era, well, that wasn't one of them. That was not our finest hour. Chicken pox in the Victorian era was being treated by using laxatives. Yeah, let that sink in for a moment. I have chicken pox, what should I do? Well, try some laxatives. Yeah, folks would slam some castor oil and then, ready for this? They would get even more sick. Who would have thought? You thought you were uncomfortable before, castor oil, yeah, chug that, and then now you're even weaker, now you're dead. Number seven, backed up. Let's say it's the Victorian era and let's say you're constipated, right? It happens, you know? Well, bad ideas will most likely follow. If you didn't already, guess that. According to Merck's 1899 medical manual, small amounts of strychnine were prescribed to those who were constipated. Yeah, the strychnose nux vomica was thought to better the gastric functions. Even a small amount of this stuff would attack your respiratory system. You'd contract, you convulse, it's horrible. It'd be a painful way to go out. It's much, much worse than being constipated. Any day, I would much rather be constipated than any type of strychnine, are you kidding me? Number six, leeches. I grew up with hearing problems. I've been around the block with ear aches, ear infections. I had ear tubes numerous times, all that jazz. So I feel really bad for the folks in this next one, okay? I hear you, pun intended. In the Victorian era, medical practitioners would say to use leeches for your ear infections. That's the number one trick, they don't want you to know. There it is. Once they're attached to you, the idea was that they could numb pain while at the same time providing proteins and peptides to its host. So on paper, again, the idea made sense. But the science didn't quite follow, did it? It wasn't entirely hopeless though. Recently in 2004, the FDA reintroduced leeches to the medical world, yeah, because their bite can break up blood clots and induce blood flow. So it's not entirely hopeless. We talked about leech collectors on this channel before, so of course we have to talk about more of the science that they were hoping to achieve with it, right? Also, I worked at a retirement home when I was 16. I thought that job sucked. Imagine being a leech collector? No way. Number five, cat attacks. If I had to pick, I would of course say I'm 100% a dog person. I got, I'm sorry, I grew up with two cats, I'm allergic. I grew up with two dogs, not allergic. Dog guy all the way, sorry. Cats are cool, but this next story just totally freaked me out. Back in 1870, this rich woman had put her time, energy, and resources into cat breeding. How lovely is that? She had tons of cats, she loved all of them, and they loved her. Again, I'm allergic, so this, I'm already sneezing, just reading about this story. It was the 1800s, okay? A lot of candles, everything was obviously extremely flammable, and disaster hit often in Victorian times. And in 1870, a fire broke out at this young woman's home. The cats were trapped inside the house. Now, they made it outside, don't freak out or anything, they all made it out, but by the time the two maids had kicked the door open to rescue said cats, they had gone full primal. They were afraid, they were freaking out. They were just scratching their way out through anyone and everything. The fire in the house had obviously scared them, so when the doors were open, these two maids were both sadly attacked by all of these cats. What a horrible thank you for saving all of their lives. I pulled my cat's tail when I was younger. I learned real quick uh, never to do that ever again. Number four, hiccups. Today we have many cures for hiccups, yeah. You gotta get scared or hold your breath or drink water like while you're doing a handstand. I don't know, everyone's got weird ideas, whatever. But nothing was as dangerous as the Victorian era hiccup cure, yeah. Ready for this one, don't try it. This one's scarier than a jump scare, that's for sure. In 1899, again, in the good old Merck Medical Manual, it recommended using chloroform to cure your hiccups. Uh? Yeah, just completely damage your entire nervous system and poison your kidneys, for sure. To get rid of hiccups, that's way better. This 19th century anesthetic was not a solution. Never try this. Continue scaring your family and friends. That's definitely the way we handle hiccups now. Number three, tapeworms. Back in the Victorian times, they really figured out the trick to weight loss. Yeah, was it watching what you eat, maybe counting your steps, maybe getting a gym membership, something like that? Nope, nope, and no way. No, it was way easier than all those things combined. Can you believe that? And you didn't even have to pull back on how much you were consuming. Doesn't this sound fascinating? What is this? Well, all you needed was a handy tapeworm. Yep, I don't have one. I don't know why I pointed. That'd be gross if I had one. Yeah, tapeworm. You know those things that can kill you today if you get one? See, the plan was if you eat a tapeworm egg, okay, it will later hatch in your stomach and at that point you could just eat anything you wanted because every time you ate, the tapeworm would also eat, so you could get your snack on while still rocking those Victorian skinny jeans, right? Tapeworm cyst pills, or go for a jog. 
Your call. Number two, Victoria's reign. Queen Victoria's reign started in 1837 and it lasted until the Queen's death later on in 1901. At just age 18, Alexandrina Victoria had to rise up to the throne. She was born, of course, on May 24th, 1819. Queen Victoria was fifth in line when she was born, so right off the bat, it was actually highly unlikely that she would ever get the crown. Then one by one, out of nowhere, all of her family members began passing away suddenly. In four years, three of Victoria's cousins passed away, and then her father and grandfather father both died a week apart from each other. So by the time 1830 rolled around, Victoria was only 11 years old and already she was next in line for the throne. That's how fast it happens. So as if that wasn't already stressful enough, Victoria was brought up under the Kensington system, which if you haven't heard of before, it's, it's pretty awful. Victoria's mother, Duchess Victoria of Kent, she created this Kensington system to control her daughter. She literally isolated the child from mates or family members, anything fun or social, you name it. Her mother did this to keep her pure, of course, to keep her the most pure lady. This system sounds awful. Her mother would monitor her every action, including who she can see or speak to. Victoria only had two playmates growing up. That's it. I'm like, hey, me too. She had her half-sister, Princess Fedora of Lennington, and the Duchess attendant, Sir John Conroy, his daughter, Victoire. I mean, only three friends growing up, that's cruel. She shared a room with her mother until she was finally queen. Yeah, she couldn't walk down the hallway alone at any point. She had to always walk with her mother by her side, even to the washroom, that's crazy. Victoria has reflected on her childhood since, and yeah, she hates John Conroy for manipulating her mother, and she actually refers to him as Demon Incarnate, so. That's good, it's a nice nickname. Incarnate, incarnate. He's a demon, he's the worst. Let's just call him that. And finally, number one, royal enemies. Being the queen and all, a security team is of course needed at all times. And during her reign, there were multiple attempts to harm the young Queen Victoria. The first attack was back in 1840. It was a young guy named Edward Oxford and he attacked the queen's carriage. Just ran at it like a crazy guy. Obviously, and thankfully, nothing happened. But when Edward was later accused of high treason, he was actually found not guilty due to insanity. Then a couple years later, in 1842, it happened again, but this time it was two men attacking the carriage. And then in 1849, her carriage was attacked by William Hamilton. In 1850, as the carriage was passing the gates of Buckingham Palace, Robert Pate, a retired soldier, ran up and hit the carriage with his cane. He was going nuts as well. Everyone wants this carriage. This is like the ultimate, no one's getting through this carriage, apparently. Victoria was okay, luckily, but of course she was shook after all these events. Then again in 1842, 1849, 1872, attempt after attempt, it was horrifying. But then things got a little worse with a man named Boy Jones. Yeah, this guy stalked the queen from 1838 until 1841. This guy somehow managed to break into Buckingham Palace more than once. He knew a way in just to Buckingham Palace, which should never be a thing in the first place. And the weird part is here, Boy Jones, once he was inside the palace, he would hide under the queen's sofa. And he would also just sit on her throne for hours, just hanging out. Yeah, he would pretend he's Cersei Lannister and just sit on the throne for a minute or two. Think about life. Eventually, thankfully, he got caught, but Imagine coming home and Boy Jones is sitting on your couch. You're like, what are you doing? Take that shirt off, get out of here. Let's start off with a title that describes the Victorians in of itself, melodrama. The Victorian era culture wasn't actually the whole fair ye black death blah blah vibe entirely. It was more like the Robert Downey Jr. Sherlock Holmes movies where it's dark and gritty and the people are obsessed with death and corruption of religion and occult stuff. The word melodrama, literally meaning music drama or song drama, derives from Greek but reached the Victorian theater by way of the French who had adopted the interest during the revolutionary period. In Britain, melodrama became the most popular kind of theatrical entertainment for most of the 18th and 19th century, a period where more people went out to the theater than any other time in history. Melodrama's unprecedented popularity during the Victorian period owes its life to the diverse audience it could draw, working class to aristocratic, but it also the illegitimate theaters that had been forbidden by law to perform drama involving spoken word. Many melodramas were book renditions or artisanal written and often featured featuring gore or death, and remained popular until the end of the 19th century. Number nine, cat attack. If I have to pick, I would say I'm 100% a dog guy. Cats are cool, don't get me wrong, but this next story freaks me out a bit. Also, I had a cat once and I pulled its tail and it hissed at me and scratched me and scared the life out of me, so dog, dogs for sure. Back in 1870, a rich woman had put her time, energy, and resources into cat breeding. 
what a fun little hobby and lifestyle. She had tons of cats, she loved them all equally and they loved her. I'm allergic also, so this story is my nightmare on a level. But it does sound like a cute time, I'll admit, that's a nice way. Especially like in the Victorian era, what a, what a lovely little pocket of fun. 1800s, a lot of candles, everything being extremely flammable, disaster hit often in Victorian times. And in 1870, a fire broke out of this young woman's home and the cats were sadly trapped in the house. They made it out alive, but by the time they made it out, the two maids that had kicked the door open to rescue them, they had gone full primal. The cats just attacked them and it was all bad. The fire in the house had obviously scared them, so when the doors were open, these two maids were both attacked by them at full force, essentially, all of these cats. Like, what a horrible thank you for saving all of their lives, you know what I mean? Number eight, quick divorce. Let's just say the love thing isn't working out, okay? It happens, people change, but now what? Say it's the Victorian era, but divorce in England isn't allowed until 1857, and it's 1856. So now what are we gonna do? Well, considering what list we're on and which part it is, it's pretty wildly unfair. If you were the wife, you were getting sold in this scenario. How horrible is that? Wife sellers, they were a thing. That was a legitimate business, how horrible. Yeah, you were getting sold if you were the wife, how horrible is that? Wife sellers was a legitimate business. There were auctions, public auctions would be done. You would watch people bid on marrying your wife. At like noon, middle of the day, people are walking by like, oh, do I have any change, hang on. This is insane. One real sale that happened in 1862 was in Selby. The asking price was a beer. The asking price for this person's wife was one pint. Sold, just like that, that's crazy. Sold, drank, now I'm married. That's insane. Other times, most of the time, it was a rather expensive exchange. I feel like there are plenty of cases where this would honestly be the ideal scenario. Just get it done in one day, whatever, peace. See you again, bye, you're the worst. Number seven, the Great Famine. We're gonna lean out of wife selling for a hot minute and include the boys for this one. Yeah, come on back in, you're all guilty. The Great Famine took out everybody, not just Victorian women, of course. Back in 1845, potato crop that a lot of the Irish population was relying on was no longer available all of a sudden. A group of microorganisms just wiped them out, just like that, and in result, around one million folks died or had to leave. It was draconian law and British ruling that made the exported food hard to reach people that really needed it. So this famine led to Irish independence and anti-union movements. A little fun bit of history I had to include on this one. Number six, the Brooklyn Theater Stampede. And we're back to absolute horribleness. Here we go. I love the theater. When the pandemic shut down plays, I actually felt pretty sad. I like sitting in full rooms watching a guy in a fake wig monologue about Mozart. Like that's my ideal Saturday night. That's the best. I don't want that to not be a thing anymore. I love theater. But today we have an obnoxious amount of distractions that can take you out of the experience. Guy's texting, fighting his ex-girlfriend two rows ahead of me. I'm trying to watch Joseph and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. I'm like, man, it's not the same anymore. Theater's not the same anymore. Turn off your phone, throw a tomato at him. It can be distracting. Exit signs can also be pretty distracting, but we need them. We definitely need them. Because in 1876, the Brooklyn Theater caught fire after a single lantern fell over on stage during a performance. This was 1876. Everybody was wearing flammable attire. There aren't emergency exits yet. A fire marshal hadn't come in and counted heads at this point, so it was a disaster. 278 people lost their lives. A monument was put up after the incident. It shook the town, it was absolutely horrible. I read about this and I was like, that's horrible. We got included in, this is a horrible list. Number five, the hobble skirt. Yeah, so when people can't get out of burning theaters, it's stuff like this to blame. Just from this 1910 headline alone, I'm glad we don't have hobble skirts anymore. The June 12th, 1910 headline reads, the hobble skirt is the latest freak in women's fashions. The latest freak. Skirts that are so tight around the ankle that locomotion is seriously impeded and speed is impossible. Nice. I'll take two, debit. Doesn't that sound like a bad time? Why would anyone want this? Sounds like you're gonna be late for everything. French designer Paul Poirier made these to free the bust, to free the, you know, have a lot of room in here, whilst shackling the legs. So you, in turn, have to, you can't move. Just where you need to move around uneven stone roads, I guess. Love the practicality on this one, Paul, thanks. Despite how ridiculous and unsafe the hobble skirt looks and acts, only the wealthy could afford such a thing. Shoot, oh man, must be nice. I'll just be over here wearing jeans like an idiot. Middle and lower class women wore skirts with slits or buttons so they could, you know, actually walk around. Yeah, what fools. Oh, sorry, you want a button? <laughs> I don't speak broke, sweetie. Number four, lead-based. 
When I started here at the studio a year and a half ago, maybe two years, I was like, okay, I gotta put on face cream maybe. A lot of, a lot of lights, a lot of HD. This, time to get rid of these bags under my eyes finally. I don't know, maybe drink some water. See what happens. Finding a skincare routine of any sorts is easy now, dare I say. The lovely World Wide Web has our back. You can learn how to draw your eyebrows on while listening to true crime. It's wonderful where we are today. But the cosmetic game, whew, back in the 18th century, not great. Turns out it wasn't that great. Not that safe. RuPaul's Drag Race would have been a lethal sport, know what I mean? Back in the 18th century, lead mixed with vinegar was often used to make your face look, you know, more pale. The Victorian look, I guess, gotta have those veins pop out. A splash of sulfur for those freckles. Horrible idea. Queen Elizabeth I used cosmetics containing lead, mercury, and or arsenic. The same poison that took out George III and Napoleon Bonaparte. So, not safe at all in any time, period. In fact, arsenic was on the priority list of hazardous substances, and toxic metal exposure is still an issue we're facing in this era, let alone Victorian. Number three, the Kensington system. Ah, oh, this was horrible. Queen Victoria was brought up under the Kensington system, which if you haven't heard it before is awful. I was grounded more often than not growing up, I'll admit, you know, I was the youngest of three, so I tried some shady stuff every now and then, but this, this is another level. At least I could go to the washroom without supervision, you know what I mean? Yeah, buckle up. Victoria's mother, Duchess Victoria of Kent, she created this Kensington system to control her daughter. She literally isolated the child from friends, family members, anybody, everybody, you name it. Her mother would monitor her every action on top of this, including who she can see or speak to, if there were any of those people at some point. Victoria only had two playmates growing up her entire life. She had her half-sister, Princess Fiodora of Lenigan, and then the Duchess attendant, Sir John Conroy, his daughter, Victoria. I mean, I had like four friends growing up, you know, maybe five, five and a half, but this is just cruel, this is just unfair. Especially with a royalty too, you'd think you can have more things. No, less. She shared a room with her mother until she was a queen. That entire time, she literally couldn't walk down the hallway alone. Victoria has reflected on her childhood, and yeah, in case you're wondering, she hates John Conrad. She referred to him as a demon incarnate, so. She's got the words. Number two, arsenic dresses. If looks could kill, literally. You've heard of arsenic and old lace at some point, but what exactly are we talking about? Back in 1861, a poet by the name of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, real name, his wife, Fanny, also real name, her dress caught on fire and her burns were so bad that of course she sadly didn't survive. But this was sadly common in Victorian days. Puffy dresses, open candles as we heard earlier. These dresses back then, they were flammable as is, but some of them were made with literal poison. Some of them had arsenic made to have that like green look, like the real arsenic green look. It wasn't just in clothing either. Back in 1861, an artificial flower maker named Matilda Schurer used green arsenic laced powder and her fingernails had turned green and green foam started coming out of her mouth and it was just a horrible way to go out. Arsenic is not supposed to be inhaled, let alone worn. Although yeah, it did look nice for a hot minute. Not worth it. And finally, number one, Queen Victoria's threats. Being the queen and all, and we're talking about the Victorian era, I figured we'd end with this one. Being the queen and all, a security team is always needed, and during her reign, there were multiple, multiple attempts to harm the young queen. The first attack was back in 1840. It was an 18-year-old man named Edward Oxford, and he fired towards the queen's carriage, but obviously and luckily missed. But when Edward was accused of high treason, he was actually found not guilty due to insanity. Then a couple years later, in 1842, it happened again. This time, two men fired at her. They were found guilty. In 1849, her carriage was attacked by William Hamilton. In 1850, as the carriage was passing the gates of Buckingham Palace, Robert Pate, a retired soldier, ran up and hit her with his cane. Victoria was okay, thankfully, but of course, she was shook. Then again in 1842, 1849, and 1872, attempt after attempt. But then things got a little worse. If you haven't heard of Boy Jones or anything that happened here, I saved it for last because it's extremely unsettling. A teenager stalked the queen back in 1838 until 1841, Edward Jones, AKA Boy Jones. This guy somehow managed to break into Buckingham Palace more than once. It was some Assassin's Creed type stuff. He just knew some back way, he climbed some window or whatever. The guy just knew a route in, so he would break in and would more often than not just hide under the queen's sofa. He would sit on her throne sometimes and one of the worst things ever, he would go through her drawers and like go through her clothes and stuff, it was creepy. He would steal her clothes until eventually and thankfully he got caught. Of all the things you can do, of all the crimes you want to commit in the Victorian era, you're gonna go hide under a couch for five years? 
Okay, I'm glad he got caught, but just so weird. What a weird ending. In 10th place, we have loss of rights under marriage. Under English common law, a married woman lost her legal independence. She could not enter contracts or sue, and her property and obligations were mostly subsumed by those of her husband, the couple becoming a single legal entity. In less legalese, any property she might have had in her name, be it through a family holdings or being, you know, signed over, became her husband's and not hers the moment she signed her marriage license. Mm. Also, any personal property acquired by the wife during the marriage effectively came under the full control of her husband. A married woman was unable to dispose of any property without her husband's consent, and upon divorce, women generally had no rights to any property accumulated during marriage, usually leaving them uh, impoverished. Women were able to retain some property they possessed prior to marriage in certain cases during a divorce. Certain cases. So if your dad gifted you, say, a summer home for safety, and you wanted to divorce your husband and take back that uh, rightfully given home for your new home, yeah, uh, good luck getting that back. Besides the dowries, prenuptial agreements effectively allowed married women to maintain beneficial interest in her previously owned or inherited real property, which was placed under trusteeship, allowing her to have a separate income from her husband. Moral of this story, sign the damn prenup. In ninth place, we have a uh, lack of consent in marriage. So in addition to losing your rights over whatever property you brought into the arrangement, if you are a girl like me, consent and rights over your own body um, didn't exist. Marriage overrode a woman's right to consent to sexual intercourse with her husband, giving him effective ownership over her body. Honestly, just add it to the dowry list. Insert man's name here uh, is to be gifted however many gold coins, a couple of cows, the right to my land, all oh, and the rights to do what he pleases with my body. Am I ever we're glad I live in today's day and age who have the right to look at that and say, uh, absolutely not. Women were expected to have sex with only one man, her husband. Just imagine a husband for me here, okay? On the flip side, it was acceptable for men to have multiple partners in their life. Some husbands had lengthy affairs with other women, while their wives stayed with their husbands because uh, divorce wasn't always an option. But if a woman had sexual contact with another man, she was seen as ruined or fallen and considered to have violated the marriage. Yeah, gotta love a double standard. Victorian literature and art was full of examples of women paying dearly for straying from moral expectations. Adulterous met tragic ends in novels, including the ones by, you know, great writers such as Tolstoy, Flaubert, or Thomas Hardy, as opposed to the modern possibility of happiness and fulfillment from adultery. While some writers and artists showed sympathy towards women's subjugation to this double standard, some works were uh, didactic and uh, reinforced the cultural norm. In the Victorian era, sex was not discussed openly and honestly. Public discussions of sexual encounters and matters were met with uh, feigned ignorance, embarrassment, and fear. One public opinion of women's sexual desire desires was that they were not very troubled by sexual urges. Even if women's desires were lurking, sexual experiences came with consequences for women and families. Limiting family sizes resulted in resisting sexual desires, except when a husband had desires which, as a wife, women were contracted to fulfill. To discourage premarital sexual relations, the new poor law provided that women bear financial responsibilities for out-of-wedlock pregnancies. In 1834, women were made legally and financially supportive of their illegitimate children. Sexual relations for women could not just be about desire and feelings. This was a luxury reserved for men. The consequences of sexual interaction actions for women took away the physical desires that woman could possess. In eighth place, we have purity culture. The ideal Victorian woman was pure, refined, and modest. Makes me gag to say it, but here goes nothing. This ideal was supported by etiquette and manners. The etiquette extended to the pretension of never acknowledging the use of undergarments, which would be referred to as unmentionables. The discussion of such a topic, it was feared, would gravitate towards unhealthy attention on anatomical details. As one Victorian lady expressed it, these are not things, my dear, that we speak of. Indeed, we try not even to think of them, in contrast to the modern norms of frank and constant discussion of, you know, details. Pardon me while I'm rolling my eyes here. The pretense of avoiding acknowledgement of anatomical realities met with uh, embarrassing failure on occasion. For example, in 1859, the Honorable Eleanor Stanley wrote about an incident where the Duchess of Manchester hooped too quickly while maneuvering over a stile. Tripping over her large hoop skirt, she went head over heels, landing on her feet with her cage and her whole petticoats above her head. They say there was never such a thing seen, and the other ladies hardly knew whether to be thankful or not that a part of her undergarments consisted in a pair of scarlet tartan knickerbockers, which were revealed to the view of 
all the world in general, and to the Duke de Malakoff in particular. What a scandal. However, despite the fact that Victorians considered the mention of women's undergarments in mixed company unacceptable, men's entertainment made great comedic material out of the topic of ladies' bloomers, including men's magazines and music hall skits. Ah, there's that icky double standard again. In seventh place, we have denial of education. Women were generally expected to marry and perform household and motherly duties, rather than seek a formal education. Even women who were not successful in finding husbands were generally expected to remain without university degrees and to take a position as a governess or as a supporter to other members of the family. The outlook for education-seeking women improved when Queen's College in Harley Street, London, was founded in 1848. The goal of this college was to um, provide governesses with a marketable education because, you know, gotta have a governess. Later, the Cheltenham Ladies College and other girls' public schools were founded, increasing educational opportunities for women's education and leading eventually to the development of the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies in 1897. I'm great at entertaining the spawn of others, but I promise you all that I'm not someone you want as a mom or a teacher. Uh -uh. In sixth place, we have lower pay. Women cannot be expected to be paid the same wage as a man for the same work. Despite the fact that women were as likely as men to be you know, married and supporting children, in 1906, the government found that the average weekly factory wage for a woman ranged from 11 cents over three days to 18 cents over eight days, whereas a man's average weekly wage was around 25 cents for nine days. Women were also preferred by many factory owners because they could be more easily induced to undergo severe bodily fatigue than men. Childminding was another necessary expense for many women working in in factories. Pregnant women worked up until the day they gave birth and returned to work as soon as they were physically able. In 1891, a law was passed requiring women to take four weeks away from the factory work after giving birth, but many women could not afford this unpaid leave and the law remained unenforced. This point as a whole is still sadly a reality in our modern day. Many women don't make the same as men for the same jobs and are expected to do more for less. In fifth place, we have job inequality. Come on, it's not enough to pay women less. We gotta give them the crappier jobs as well. The lowest paying jobs available to working class London women were matchbox making and sorting rags in a rag factory where flea and lice ridden rags were to be sorted to be pulped for manufacturing paper. Needlework was the single largest paid occupation for women working from home, but the work paid little and women often had to rent sewing machines if they could not purchase them. So where's that money going? These home manufacturing industries became known as sweated industries. The select committee of the House of Commons defined sweated industries in 1890 as work carried on for inadequate wages and for excessive hours in unsanitary conditions. Wow, I'm shocked. By 1906, such workers earned about a penny an hour. In fourth place, we have limitations on hobbies. Yep because controlling a woman's body, work, and forcing her to run a household and reproduce wasn't enough. Nah. Women's physical activity was a cause of concern at the highest levels of academic research during this time. Sadly, uh, here in Canada, physicians debated the appropriateness of women using bicycles. Remember that purity culture I mentioned a moment ago? Yeah, here we go again. A series of letters published in the Dominion Medical Monthly and Ontario Medical Journal in 1896 expressed concern that women seated on a bicycle seat could have uh, an organ Oh no. Fearful of unleashing and creating a nation of oversexed females, some physicians urged colleagues to encourage women to give up modern dangers and continue to pursue traditional leisure pursuits. Seriously? However, not all medical colleagues were convinced of the link between cycling and and this debate on women's leisure activities continued well into the 20th century. In the early part of the 19th century, it was believed that physical activity was dangerous and inappropriate for women. Girls were taught to reserve their delicate health for the express purpose of birthing healthy children, and one of these considered benefits of the corset was to restrict respiration. Don't worry, I'll get back to corset health and myths in just a moment. Furthermore, the physiological differences between the sexes helped to reinforce the societal inequality. An anonymous female writer was able to contend that women were not intended to fill male roles because women Women are, as a rule, physically smaller and weaker than men, their brain is much lighter, and they are in every way unfitted for the same amount of bodily or mental labor that men are able to undertake. Well, pardon me and my tiny brain. Can I be excused and paid to go sit on a fainting couch? In third place, we have corset trends. I'm gonna start this by making sure everyone knows that I'm emphasizing the harmful trends, not dismissing corsets as a whole. I'm personally a huge fan of corsets and various historical shapewear, since when worn properly, they're actually quite comfortable and beneficial to one's health and posture. Improperly worn corsets, or ones worn too tight, can cause a variety of problems. And my displaced ribs are a sad example of that. Anyhow, allow me to continue before I sidetrack myself to infinity and beyond. Victorian women's clothing followed trends that emphasize 
stylized elaborate dresses. Skirts with wide volume created by the use of layered materials such as crinolines, hoop skirt frames, and heavy fabrics. The ideal silhouette of the time demanded a narrow waist, which was accomplished by constricting the abdomen with a tightly laced corset. While the silhouette was striking, and the dresses themselves were often exquisitely detailed creations, the fashions weren't ideal. At best, they restricted women's movements, and at worst, they had a harmful effect on women's health. Physicians turned their attention to the use of corsets and uh, determined that they caused several medical problems. Compression of the thorax, restricted breathing, organ displacement, poor circulation, and uh, prolapsed uterus. Oh no, can't harm that baby making factory. Articles advocating the reform of women's clothing by the British National Health Society, the Ladies Dress Association, and the Rational Dress Society were reprinted in the Canada Lancet, Canada's medical journal. Nowadays, corsets are a choice, not a necessity, and I often prefer them over the more popular underwear bra. In second place, we have Magdalene Asylums. So Magdalene, As so Magdalene Asylums, also known as Magdalene Laundries, were initially Protestant, but later mostly Roman Catholic institutions that operated from the 18th to the late 20th centuries to house uh, fallen women. The institutions were named after the biblical figure Mary Magdalene, who in you know, earlier centuries characterized as a reformed lady of the night. The term referred to female sexual promiscuity or work in undesirable fields, young women who became pregnant outside of marriage, or young women who just didn't have familial support. They were required to work without pay. Apart from meager food provisions, well, the institutions operated large commercial laundries, serving customers outside of their bases. Many of these laundries were effectively operated as penitentiary workhouses. The strict regimes of the institutions were often more severe than those found in prisons. This contradicted the perceived outlook that they were meant to help women, as opposed to uh, punishing them. The last one known closed only in 1996, which is a year before I was born, so they went on for way too long. In our first place, we have Woman of the Night. During the Victorian age, women selling their bodies was a wide-scale problem in Britain. The very essence of it went against every moral value that was promoted during this time. Values such as, you know, chastity, prudence, and grace were dismissed and disregarded by fallen women. These women were led into this line of work for varying reasons, the most prominent being, you know, social and economic concerns. Upon entering into this world, there were several different avenues that could be taken by women, including military encampments, brothels, and, um, street walking. The number of women participating in this trade during the Victorian age was uh, staggeringly high. Although London police reports recorded that you know there were approximately 8,600 women of the night known to them, it has been suggested that the true number during this time was closer to 80,000. As a result, concerns were raised and the prominence led to several government acts. Goodness forbid a woman try and make money for herself on her own terms through selling something that would already be part of a dowry. This act would allow women to barter within the marketplace without influence of men who would often take their earnings and goods. Number 10, tool skirt. Tool skirts were a major problem. Although these were chiefly worn by ballerinas, ballet has always been a destructive form of dance when it comes to basically how it affects the body. I mean, many ballerinas literally have their toenails fall off as a result of dancing on point. That's just kind of like an assumed part of the profession if you're dancing point. However, we aren't even talking about the feet here. We're actually talking about how safe the costumes are, the literal garments they dance around in, not even their shoes or their feet. The answer to that question, they're not very safe. Considering that before electricity, many danced on candlelit stages, you'd likely be horrified to hear just how flammable these costumes were. There are many examples throughout history of ballerinas and dancers getting too close to candle flames while in their costumes and basically lighting on fire. And I gotta say, I've listened to multiple podcasts that have talked about this, so I could recommend some to you. If you want some, let me know in the comments. I'll send them your way. Emma Livery is by far one of the most famous ballerinas though to have caught flame. She actually did initially survive the incident, but she died eight months later as a result of her injuries. That sounds terrible. And there were honestly countless others who suffered similar fates. The really terrible thing is back in the day, this is something new that I found out, we actually had the means to make fire retardant costumes. but. They affected the aesthetic of the costumes, making the costumes appear a little bit more stiff. So rather than try to save the more than thousands of ballerinas who died in even just a single year, we decided to opt for beauty over safety. To me, that's pretty scandalous, I'm gonna be honest. Scandalous and disappointing. In ninth place, we have hats made from taxidermied birds. Not gonna lie, I'm not the biggest fan of taxidermy, even though I have a friend who has a museum in his home that has more than a few pieces. Granted, he mostly focuses on albino taxidermy. But hey, 
to each their own. What began as a few plumes from herons, jays, and you know pheasants tucked into the brims of headwear became a wildly popular trend, which the fashion industry capitalized on by going to the extreme, adding entire taxidermy birds to very tall hats, as well as stuffed hummingbirds to decorative hand fans. According to the Victorianist, millinery fashion took a truly bizarre turn in the 1880s, when hat crowns grew tall, offering a generous display area for, in the most extreme examples, an extraordinary array of animals, including cats and squirrels. I don't even want to imagine the amount of flies that would be circling, you know, around hats that was still a trend in today's world. How warm things are thanks to global warming. Also, I rave for neck health since I doubt those hats were very light, and as someone who has worn a couple of very heavy wigs in my lifetime, they tend to take a toll. In eighth place, we have Victorian death photographs. So photographs of loved ones taken after they died may seem kind of morbid by today's standards, but in Victorian England, they were a way of commemorating the dead and blunting the sharpness of grief. Remember, unless you were rich enough to have a painting commissioned, there really wasn't a way to preserve visual proof that someone existed and how they looked for future generations. In images that are both unsettling and strangely, you know, fitting, families poised with the dead and consumptive young ladies elegantly reclined, the disease not only taking their life, but, you know, increasing their beauty. Victorian life was was full of death. Epidemics such as diphtheria, typhus, and cholera scarred the country, and from 1861 onwards, the bereaved queen made mourning fashionable. Trinkets of memento mori, meaning remember you must die, took several forms and existed long before Victorian times. Long exposures when taking photographs meant that the dead were often seen more sharply than the slightly bird living, because of their lack of movement. On some occasions, eyes would be painted onto the photograph after it was developed, which was meant to make the deceased more lifelike, while other times death was a lot more obvious. Locks of hair cut from the dead were arranged and worn in lockets and rings. Death masks were created in wax, and the images and symbols of death appeared in paintings and sculptures. But in the mid-1800s, photography was becoming increasingly popular and affordable, leading to memento mori photographic portraiture. Try saying that five times fast. The first successful form of photography, the daguerreotype, was an expensive luxury, but not nearly as costly as having a portrait painted, which, like I said before, that was the only way you could do it first. As the number of photographers increased, the cost of daguerreotypes fell. Less costly procedures were introduced in the 1850s, such as using thin metal, glass, or paper rather than silver. Pricey, pricey silver. In seventh place, we have uses for arsenic. Pardon me, uses other than ending lives. But you know, that also makes me want to consider a top 10 creative ways to dispose of people. Martha Ponder. Arsenic invaded almost every aspect of life in 19th century Britain, leaving a toll of death and illness. A byproduct of an emerging smelting industry, arsenic was cheap and readily available as rat killer by uh, the early 1800s. It was also odorless and tasteless, and easily confused with flour or sugar or other cooking essentials. By the mid-1830s, morbid descriptions of death from arsenic terrified the public and became a staple of the British popular press. But most of the fatalities from arsenic were more pedestrian. From accidental use in food or from exposure to arsenical compounds in consumer goods such as fabric dyes and wallpapers in facilities that made these products and in the polluted air. Arsenic was used even in medications to treat everything from asthma and cancer to reduce libido and skin problems. Now, Victorians were just as obsessed with their bodies as we are, if not more dangerously. Many women used arsenic to fight wrinkles, and men swallowed arsenic tablets as kind of a pre-Pfizer Viagra. It's unclear if arsenic can actually be used to um, turn compasses to true north, but it doesn't seem advisable to try it. I feel like there are much safer ways to get a uh, motor running, if you will. In sixth place, we have wasp wastes. We all know that corsets were a thing in the Victorian era, but they were much more extreme than most people might think. Many women cinched themselves down until they had very tiny wasp waist. With super snug corsets that didn't just rearrange your insides, they made it impossible to breathe. Now, before anyone starts calling all corsets or stays awful to wear, they're only bad for your health if you're trying to accomplish the above improperly. As a gal who corsets often for fashion and posture purposes, I've only ever experienced discomfort when they weren't properly fitted, like when, or when I was wearing them for too long, or when I was wearing the combination of a too small steel boned one outdoors in the cold for too long. But this is a do as I say and not as I do kind of situation, since that was like a one time thing and my ribs have very much learned their lesson. Long story short, corsets are not bad, you just have to wear them properly. You trust me, right? In fifth place, we have grave robbing. Now, my first thought when I said that just now was Grave Robber the character, which only goes to show how much repo the genetic opera has wrought in my brain. One of the most lucrative side hustles of the Victorian era was grave robbing, and the fresher the corpse, the better. Medical students needed cadavers to study, so a black market of corpses arose, enriching adventurous thieves and uh, angering families of the dearly departed. The 19th century was also a fertile age of exploration, and one of the most impressive discoveries were ancient mummies that the people of Victorian England brought home from Egyptian vacations. They'd invite all of their friends over for unwrapping parties, which tended to be rather grim spectacles, that nevertheless delighted the morbid weirdos. Look, while I don't condone it, I wouldn't mind time traveling back to be a fly on the wall at those parties, since I 
definitely classify myself as a morbid weirdo. At one notable gathering for the unwrapping of Nescons, the second wife of Theban high priest Pinogem, the second, was placed in a contraption that made her appear to dance. The demand for mummies to take home was so high that Egyptians started transporting them from less visited ruins to areas that had a lot more traffic. Hey, whatever helps the economy. In fourth place, we have garden hermits. So the next time somebody shows off their garden to you, make sure to ask where they keep their hermit. And if they don't have one, make sure to comment on how undignified it is. In the Victorian era, wealthy families hired people to don full hermit garb, complete with robes, long hair, beards, and hermit glasses, and live as an ornamental garden hermit on their land. The biggest rule of all though? No speaking to anyone on the property. And honestly, sounds like a dream job to me. Ugh, being paid in house to not speak to anyone and just be like a silly little decoration feature? Sounds like upgraded background work, and I will totally take it. Granted, that's if someone wants like a spooky ooky gothic garden feature. I'm all yours. In third place, we have shock treatment. No, I'm not talking about the cursed as all get out sequel to Rocky Horror, but more people should be. I've only watched it once, but it does have some bops for sure. In the 19th century, Victorians thought electrotherapy could fix everything from gout to muscle problems. All you had to do was pay your local electrotherapist who shocked the problem area, but really all it did was leave a lot of people with icky scars. In more modern times though, it has been refined to work well for muscle issues, but it uh, wasn't always that way. In second place, we have weird face masks. Patented in 1875, Madame Raleigh's face mask was strapped to a woman's head overnight three nights per week. That was how you do it, you followed the rules. Made of flexible India rubber, the mask could be filled with unguents and all manners of cells and bleaches to uh, treat the skin. However, the mask did have a second purpose, which was to make the face sweat all night long. Also called the face glove, the device would excite perspiration with a view to soften and clarify the skin by relieving the pores and the superficial circulation. Inventor Helen Raleigh claimed the mask could be used by persons suffering with certain forms of disease or afflicted with a bad complexion, which came in the form of cutaneous eruptions, blotches, pimples, freckles, or fugitive discolorations, and for clogged pores and capillary congestion. So, a uh, cure-all? Now, this mask became very, very popular and uh, led to some market competition. One improved overnight mask was made of flannel, while another complained that existing masks didn't allow for poisonous gases to escape, so she proposed layers of chamois and satin. And hey, if all else failed, Victorian women layered raw beef or veal over their faces before bed. I love a good face mask as much as the next person, but um, I think I'll stick with what I already know. In first place, we have corpse medicine. The Victorian era ushered in the tail end of corpse medicine, which was the practice of ingesting different parts of the human body to cure various ailments. One popular drink to cure apoplexy mixed powdered human skull and chocolate, while the most coveted remedy mixed skull with uh, booze to each their own. By the 19th century, most doctors had uh, moved away from this barbarous practice, but medical texts and cookbooks that explained you know, how to best repair a body part suggested that it was far from uh, dead. To get fresh supplies, people often went to an executioner rather than a pharmacist, paying good money for the freshest of fresh products as recommended by a doctor that was shockingly not accused of being a vampire. I even found a recipe for uh, red fluid marmalade. And that brings us to the end of our list, and uh, people really used to do the craziest things. I'll stick to my modern traditions that are a little less uh, life threatening. Number 10. No calling, no gifts. This is a time in history when men were told to be gentlemen and women told to be ladies. Naturally, that came with some weird social practices. For instance, women were discouraged from accepting gifts from men. Personally, I like to give my girlfriend flowers and chocolate. I'm a classic guy, what can I say? Can't go wrong with that. However, even if a handsome silver tongued devil such as myself were to give some flowers and the finest dark chocolate a 7 Eleven has to offer, and a most promising woman were to accept said gifts, she may not be able to call me back. Literally, because well, the phone isn't exactly a thing yet, and also because that's something else women were just discouraged from doing. Pfft. Call on a man? <laughs> no way, Jose! Even if he is super nice and waiting for a genuine response. One etiquette guidebook from 1882 called any woman who calls on a man ill-bred and positively improper to do so. I like when people give me flowers and chocolate. Maybe call me sometimes, I'm a little lonely. For instance, number 9 in our countdown is smoke inhalation for asthma and other lung conditions. This may be one of the more counterintuitive remedies on our list, as it's easy to see now that smoke is not beneficial for asthma at all. Through the late 19th and into the next, however, inhaling smoke or 
smoke as well as stramonium, a hallucination inducing nightshade, as well as lobelia, known for its sedative properties, were popular treatments for asthmatics. Asthma is caused when your airways can narrow or swell while producing excess mucus. Smoking meanwhile has been shown to eventually reduce the number of cilia, the lungs filaments which help transport mucus into the lungs, which only leads to the worsening of asthma symptoms. This wasn't the only weird tobacco smoke belief however, in 1872 an English newspaper talked of tobacco smoke enemas, which even reported that hundreds of lives might have been spared by the tobacco smoke enema. Okay. Weird enough. Plasters, no not the British word for band-aids, is number 8. This medical treatment was said to have sucked the badness out of a person. They were like a nicotine patch made up of a thin layer sheet of wax as well as leather and it was able to stick onto the skin. In the wax there were remedies such as lead, opium, frankincense, tobacco, etc. This mix would be applied while still warm to ensure the adhesion of the plaster. Plasters were sold to anyone of any age and came in many different shapes and sizes so that they may be applied to different areas. Areas. What were they used for? Everything. Cough, cold, period pain, organ failure, alcoholism, headache, the list can go on forever. Seeing as they wanted the patch to pull as much badness from the body as possible, these patches could be left on for two days to two weeks to forever. Without washing, of course. Naturally, these patches trapped in a lot of moisture that could cause infections, blisters, rashes, and hives underneath, especially once the patch is removed and the skin is finally exposed to air. Arsenic, like plasters, was a cure all, and it's number seven in the countdown. If you've seen our other video, Top 10 Unusual Fashion Trends from the Victorian Era, you might know that arsenic was in everything in the Victorian era. Makeup, wallpaper, dye. No exception was made in medicine either as arsenic was prescribed for anything from anemia in Merrick's diagnosis manual to anthrax, cancer, reduced libido, syphilis, or even cholera. While it was most popular to consume arsenic, it could also be inhaled or injected. Being a byproduct of smelting, it's no wonder arsenic was everywhere during the industrial revolution as there was an excess of it. So it was incredibly accessible and a household remedy. Since doctors already prescribed it to do so much, everyday people just start to use it to treat any common ailment. Unsurprisingly, many people suffered arsenic poisoning symptoms. The ailments are now referred to as Fowler's disease. Number 6 is all kinds of gross and questionable. The everlasting pill. When the Merck manual was first published, part of the comprehensive treatment plan for an eruptive fever, which is a classification for diseases like scarlet fever, smallpox, and chickenpox, was actually laxatives. Castor oil was the main laxative choice for Victorians up until until the debut of the everlasting pill, made up of a metal now known to be toxic called antimony, would be invented. Swallowing this would induce severe vomiting and diarrhea, thus giving the body what they thought to be a healthy cleanse, and their intention was to purge diseases from the body. It earned the name the everlasting pill, as the pill would pass through the gastric system mostly intact, meaning it could be retrieved and cleaned for future use. Seeing as the metal was greatly valuable at the time, it was quite common to keep it in the family and hand it down generation to generation. Imagine getting that in your granny's will. Watch out, it may shock ya. Number 5 is shock treatment. When profit can be made off of insecurity, unsavory business flourishes. Victorians honed in on the man's moral weaknesses as a cause for erectile dysfunction, and impotence was thought to be caused by either too much sex and masturbation, or not enough. So doctors took a few shocking routes, literally, such as galvantic baths, or bathtubs filled with electrodes, which were supposed to restore sexual desire in an advertised six sessions. For a more direct approach, a thin rod with running electric current could be placed up into a man's ear. Repeat that twice a week, about five minutes each time, and your little man should be ready to rumble. By the late 1800s, ads were running for electric belts aimed at weak men. They claimed to help cure kidney pain and sciatic nerve issues and backaches and headaches and nervous exhaustion, and of course, mainly their dysfunction. While today impotence is recognized as the result of physical or mental duress, age, or genetics, the belief that electric shock therapy is a useful cure for impotence still persists, and some studies have shown positive signs. See that, fellas? Don't knock it till you try it. Speaking of electrocuting genitals, you can't tell me that didn't happen at least once with the first electric vibrators, which is number 4 in our countdown. Female hysteria became a diagnosable medical condition way back in medieval times when the concept of a wandering uterus, when a discontented or displaced uterus would cause a woman ill health, was first coined. Believed to have symptoms such as irritability, insomnia, fainting, anxiety, menstruation, or horniness, pretty much every woman showed these symptoms. Hysteria was 
pretty common. Doctors cure hysterical paroxysm and orgasm. For hundreds of years leading up to this invention, doctors were manually administering pelvic massages to women to achieve the necessary cure. But all that wrist work added up over time and doctors needed a break. So cue Dr. Joseph Mortimer Granville, he created an electric steam powered electromechanical medical instrument, nicknamed the manipulator. The device allowed women to give themselves home massages to cure their wandering wombs and giving doctors the well deserved break they needed. A questionable cure for a very questionable diagnosis. Number 3 is not for the faint of heart, they loved leeches. It may be crazy to imagine, but between the late 1700s and well into the early 1900s, there was a booming leech trade all across Europe. Leeches were shipped from Germany to America by the tens of thousands. England even had to start importing them from France by the mid 1800s as their own leech stocks were not even enough to supply their own doctors. Francis Bressoyas believed that all diseases resulted from the excess buildup of blood and documented this belief in a medical journal that would subsequently cause leeches to become the go to treatment in France and then later spread across Europe. This usage of leeches then became worldwide from there and so obscene that the creatures started to go extinct. However, what these quacks didn't know is that bloodletting was very, very, very rarely beneficial to any conditions and applying leeches often resulted in detrimental side effects such as blood loss, diarrhea and vomiting or those with poor immune systems could even be exposed to hazardous bacteria and infection. Let alone death from hemorrhagic shock for literally anyone they did this to. Eventually the excessive use of leeches meant that they became too expensive to ship, too scarce due to the over farming to find, and medically obsolete in the face of new science that questioned the medical merits of bloodletting. Thank god. Number 2 doesn't allow you to touch where number 1 usually comes out. It's the masturbatory mental illness. Obviously it's natural, normal and well fun, but the Victorian perspective of masturbation was nowhere near what it is today. As our old timely friends saw it as a serious threat to mental and physical health or even could kill you. Self love was seen as an ultimate evil, but beyond moralistic arguments many physicians thought that every orgasm drained a mans energy. Married men were warned by doctors to limit the amount of sex they were having, while unmarried men were encouraged and urged to conserve their essence by avoiding sex altogether, particularly masturbation. Even wet dreams and uncontrolled ejaculation were considered a sexual dysfunction function as masturbation essentially became the male version of hysteria. So how did you treat this condition? Men had to stop masturbating. Fear and shame campaigns did what they do best and stimulated the market to provide quick quack remedies. They came in the form of anti-masturbation devices that looked like torture chambers. Most popular was the jugum, which was a metal ring attached around the base of a man's, you know, and then screwed on. If he was to become erect at any point, whether awake or asleep, the now inflated skin would make contact with sharp metal teeth that would dig in. Like I said, most popular. Consider how much worse these other options were for that to be the primo choice. A spermatic truss was essentially the first jock strap, but meant for every day. And the Bowden device fastened a little metal helmet to the end of a man's member that bound up into his pubic hair so that it would be ripped out should he become erect. I'm more than happy to keep going, but I'm sure more than enough people are wincing right now. Keep in mind, while these men were going through this to avoid masturbation, women were being prescribed it as a cure. Number one on our countdown may be a bit of a surprise. Surgery. How could surgery be a questionable treatment? Well, it itself isn't, but the men performing it and their hygiene towards surgery were. Most famous is Robert Liston. Said to be able to remove a leg in 30 seconds, he notoriously used his own mouth to hold scalpels, knives, and even once sucked the pus out of a woman's throat wound. According to medical historian Dr. Lindsay Fitzharris, surgeons never washed their instruments or their hands, and Victorian surgeons were known for wearing old surgery garments out of prowess, reportedly so stiff with old blood that they were nearly cardboard in appearance. Even the operating tables themselves were rarely washed down, and it was said a visitor to St. George's Hospital in London 1825 discovered mushrooms and maggots thriving in the damp, dirty sheets of a patient's bed. When asked why they hadn't complained, the patient assumed this to be the norm. And what about surgery in the moment? Well, the patients were conscious and undrugged as they were operated on, and surgeries needed to be fast as a result. One in four people died 
side after their surgery, whether it was still on the operating table or from infections afterwards. But what about our buddy I mentioned, Dr. Liston? Only one in ten of his patients die. This was because of his speed. Time me, gentlemen, time me, he'd shout to the surgery spectators to put his legendary speed to the test. Sure, he did accidentally castrate somebody once because of his wild motions, but nobody's perfect. In fact, while he's remembered for being the first surgeon to use anesthesia, wash his knives, and invent a still used medical tool, he is the only surgeon to ever have a 300% death rate. I'd be remiss not to mention that during a leg amputation, his lightning speed reportedly cut off three fingers of the assistant who had been holding down the patient. Then, as he brought the knife back up, he slashed the coat of a spectator. The spectator reportedly died immediately of fright, likely a heart attack. Though the assistant and patient survived initially, like most who were treated in Victorian hospitals, they died not long after from infection, which was also just called hospitalism at the time because of how many people died that way. It's easy to say that going to a Victorian surgery or a hospital may have been as efficient as rubbing dirt into a wound. In 10th place, we have deadly party games. So back in the day, board games weren't the massive industry they are today, and Victorians loved their parlor games, even more so when they risked their lives doing it. Because, you know, why not? One such game was called Snapdragon and involved pouring raisins into a bowl, soaking them in rum, and setting them on fire before scrambling to remove as many raisins as possible and chomp them down while they were still aflame. Because, you know, why not? Another game was called Hot Cockles, and I couldn't make all of this up if I tried. Blindfolded and with your head in someone's lap, partygoers would take turns kicking you in the rear end, and then you uh, had to guess who it was that kicked you. This sounds not only uncomfortable from the start, but like it could quickly get out of hand, and my tailbone hurts thinking about it. Yet another game was called Cellar Stairs, and involved walking backwards down a flight of stairs using a handheld mirror as your only guide. Supposedly the features of your future mate would appear in the mirror, but it seems more likely that you would just, you know, fall down the stairs, and I know I would have. My balance is not the best. Finally, there's the Candle and Apple game, sometimes called Snap Apple. The game was so popular in the 18th and 19th centuries that Halloween was often referred to as Snap Apple Night. Candles and apples would be hung from the ceiling, and the goal is to get a bite of the apple without consuming any wax or getting burned. As a former altar girl who used to play with wax, youch! I can't imagine just how much that would hurt my face. Also, I think I found where uh, Ready or Not got its inspiration. Number nine, top hat cigar holders. Yeah, this one here is so Victorian. I love it. In the Victorian era, smoking cigars was a popular pastime amongst wealthy men. If you were rich, you had to smoke cigars all day, every day, and then cough nonstop. Cigar holders, of course, were used to prevent the cigar smoke from directly entering the smoker's mouth and to keep the cigar cool and on your persons. There were various types of cigar holders during the Victorian era, ranging from simple wooden or metal tubes to more elaborate designs made of ivory, silver, or sometimes gold. Fancy schmancy. Some holders were designed to be attached at the end of a walking stick, while others could be worn as a pendant on a chain, or in this case, for some reason, a top hat. Yeah, why is there smoke coming from that man's head? I wonder if he's okay. Oh, he's just bad. That's cool. My mistake, sir. Continue on with your Victorian cigar stroll. Yeah, people's heads were smoking. They would keep all of them lit on their top hat. What a weird place to hold them. Cigar holders were often personalized with the owner's initials or family crest, and they were considered a status symbol, although it looked ridiculous on a top hat. This was a way to flex your wealth, you know what I mean? There were no broke boys walking around with top hats. No way. Or cigar holders on said top hats. No way, that's insane. That's a lot of weight on a hat. I'd be, I'd be doing this a lot. Number eight, the fork and knife cleaner. In theory, in the Victorian era, this one sounds great, but it also seems like way more effort than just hand washing, you know? I don't know, let's talk about it. Invented in 1850 by Thomas Parker in Kensington, the knife and fork cleaner in the 1850s, it was pretty significant. It was a big improvement in the process of cleaning cutlery, a bit, I guess. Prior to this invention, cleaning knives and forks was a time-consuming and often challenging task. Definitely harder than it is today to wash a dish. The knife and fork cleaner consisted of a handheld device with multiple bristles and brushes and gears that would all fit around the knife or the fork, and then it would spin and move around. Again, looks like a saw trap. The user would then rub the utensil back and forth through the bristles to remove any food or debris. It took a while, and like I'm saying, a little bit more effort, probably. This invention was particularly used for commercial kitchens where large quantities of cutlery needed to be cleaned quickly, so restaurants, whatever. It was also popular among households, even though it didn't last too long. It's definitely worth a mention. It looks scary more than anything. I wouldn't be like, ugh, cleaning my fork, like, don't eat my arm, thank you. Number seven, Vigor's horse action saddle. All right, now we're into it, here we go. I mentioned the fuzzy wonder earlier. This thing here, Vigor's horse action saddle. Yeah, action saddle. We've got some action here. There we go. This saddle would sit somewhere in your home, ideally in a place where no one else could see you. That's 
great at the start. The way they marketed this thing back then, they made it sound like it was an actual health benefit riding this <laughs> big vibrator, for lack of a better term. That's all it did, it just vibrated and you sat on it. That's all I'll say, that's all I'm allowed to say. On the patent, it states that Vigor's horse action saddle can promote good spirits, it quickens circulation, it stimulates the liver, and probably other places, and it even creates an appetite. Yeah, all that and the thing that shakes you up in the corner of your house. Imagine it's the Victorian era and you have to watch your drunk uncles take turns riding this thing all weekend long. This is far too intimate for the family room. This is kind of gross. Yeah, it vibrates a lot and really hard, so that's it. You can do the rest. You can think the rest of the thoughts, dirty freaks. Number six, the toilet mask. Madame Rowley's toilet mask. Okay, where do I even begin with this one? At first, I thought that this was a mask that you had to wear while you took a shit. I mean, compared to everything else on this list, I was like, yeah, sure. People would wear the Phantom of the Opera masks every time they had to go to the washroom. Probably, who knows? They were weird back then. A toilet mask was not that. I mean, not too far from that. A toilet mask was a natural beautifier for bleaching and preserving your skin. <laughs> Victorian bleach. Easy, that's fun. The patent even stated that this mask would remove complexion imperfections. Complexion imperfections, see you later. Huh, what a treat, how lucky are we? All you have to do is wear this mask three times a week. For how long? I don't know, doesn't say. Just feel it out, I guess. Just feel out the bleach. Turns out lead cosmetics pasted onto a mask and bleach. Turns out it was not beneficial for your health at all. Who knew? Not me. Ah, uh, yes, let me put on my bleach mask before, well, I can't breathe or see anymore. Never mind, I'm gonna stop wearing that. Number five. Automatic smoking machines. When I read about this, I actually laughed my ass off for like a minute straight. I get some of these inventions or where these inventions were trying to go. Like an indoor saddle, sure, that's fun, I guess, if you want it to be. The mask at the time was thought to have beauty benefits. The automatic smoking machine was all bad. I don't see any good thing about this thing. It's not even designed well, it looks like sh in the corner. It was just a machine that smoked all of your cigarettes. Yeah, it smoked them automatically and then blew the smoke all over your curtains. What a great invention. Nice, 10 out of 10. Gonna review that. What a perfect addition to the family. This thing, first of all, was not small. It was not petite. It looked like a saw trap placed in the corner. It was so Victorian and scary looking. There's gears and pulleys and they're like, there's smoke pluming out of random places. It's like having a choo-choo train in your house. Who wants this? A choo-choo train that gave you lung cancer. Nice, score. Merry Christmas. Yeah, fire it up. It only takes 80 cigarettes at a time. I know. Number four, the surprise chair. Are you tired of sitting down on chairs that, you know, stay still and don't immediately topple back once you apply any amount of pressure? Well, don't I have just the thing for you? Here we go. The surprise Victorian chair. I guess it was invented for laughs in a world before Netflix. Sure, I guess. You have to be creative. There's no sign of practicality in this patent, so we're gonna go ahead and assume that these 1800s folks, they were hilarious. They loved a practical gag. I'm not even gonna say prank. Don't even make me say prank, YouTube. Not saying the P word. The patent shows the exact science here and what it takes to surprise your guest and then have them topple to the ground. I go, ah, ha, ha, and then you bring them back up and then give them the real chair. This is a prank gift, and if we've learned anything in time, getting prank gifts, it only works once. So once you get your pal to take a topple in the 1800s, Hundreds, you would then have to store this heavy, antique, horrible looking heavy chair somewhere in your home and then bring the real chair back. Again, it sounds like way too much effort for a very low payoff. Imagine that, 400 pound chair. They're like, yeah, gotcha. All right, who next? Number three, toilet troubles. Now the Victorian era, it was, it was unsanitary to say the least, sure. But it was also dangerous in ways that you wouldn't expect. Some random poo-poo signs coming out of you. One of the greatest Victorian inventions was the bathroom. I love this one, it's great. Now, it took a few tries to figure out the whole methane gas problem, but we did it. Yeah, spontaneous combustion of the bathroom was weirdly common in the V era. Flammable gases like methane and hydrogen sulfide, well, they build up over time with human waste. And more human waste than just, well, so much and gases, it built up in the sewers and eventually it backed up into our homes. Next thing you know, you're lighting a candle and then your bathroom's gone and you're gone and there's everywhere and it's the Victorian era and you're like, what do I even do right now? What just happened? What science was that? Number two, the wave rockin' bath. Seaside at home, let's do it. Are you tired of regular bathtubs that are stationary, relaxing and don't soak your entire floor in minutes? Well, the Niagara wave rockin' bath washes all that away. Yep, see you later. This bathtub was designed to rock, literally. It kept your blood in active circulation, apparently, and it only required three pails of water. Also a bull 
The patent promised the fullest illusion of a sea or a river bath, whilst promising absolutely no water will splash on the floor. Yeah, good joke. No way that's gonna happen. And it didn't happen because that's way too good to work out. Imagine having this now growing up. Are you kidding me? My mom would be yelling at me to clean up the floor immediately. I already made enough splashes with just a stationary bathtub. I don't want a, a rocking bathtub. I'm trying to rinse my hair. I'm like, this sucks. Everywhere. It's so stupid. Just doing this is so stupid. Looking at lights. Finally, number one, beauty patches. Oh, we need to bring back beauty patches ASAP. Imagine me right now doing this list with an 800s beauty patch. You'd hit that thumbs up immediately. You'd be like, this Victorian man is straight out of time. These patches came in all shapes and sizes. Now, even in this portrait from 1755, quite a ways ago, Joshua Reynolds painted Charles, the ninth Lord Carthart, rocking a large beauty patch. These beauty patches go way back. Also, look at him. That's a Lord right there with that He's confident, got one of those, he's great. Beauty patches in the 1800s, they were small, tiny circles, sometimes even hearts or stars, which is, that's pretty fun, you go. Now the reason for these patches, and sometimes having more than one, is because they were commonly used to cover up smallpox scars. Yeah, we found out your secret, you Victorian era gentlemen. They were made out of silk velvet and they were applied with glue, so if you pick a spot, you better be confident. The patches were dark black and they were also meant to make your pale skin pop, which again, imagine if I had one right now, you'd you blind. I'm so pale as is already. If I put one of those patches on, I'm going to be able to see the screen. You turn that brightness down real quick. The position of these patches could also determine your political allegiance. Historian Joseph Addison took note of these positions when observing two political parties from back in the 1800s. One party had beauty patches on the right side of their face, while the other side had the opposite. Today we have uh, Twitter. Yeah, usually you can tell someone's political allegiance by just taking a glimpse of that. You're like, oh dear, no, that's, we don't want to talk to that guy. He's a, he's a right patch kind of guy. Number 10 is chloroform the hiccups away. Nowadays we know a nasty case of hiccups is curable by just holding your breath or chugging a bunch of water. But if this was 1899, you'd be prescribed chloroform. Known by many as the mysterious liquid on the rag placed over the someone's face to make them faint in many period pieces or cartoons, chloroform gained popularity after Queen Victoria demanded its usage during her labor in 1853. After having been denied it in her pre previous labors. By taking these lengths to reduce the annoyance of hiccups, your vital organs may pay a steep price. Chloroform has the potential to damage the nervous system, lungs, and trachea, as well as the liver and kidney when exposed long term. This is just one of many medical remedies that we'll be covering from the first Merrick Manual of Diagnosis and Therapy, the oldest continuously published English language medical textbook. All the quack treatments in our list today used to be found in this mass encyclopedia. Number 9. Showing some shoulder. Ooh. <laughs> The crazy thing is we actually just came from an era before this when showing shoulders was actually considered very fashionable. But by the time the Victorian era really started to kick into gear, this was actually considered completely improper. Paintings even had to be repainted to reflect this new trend because showing a bit of shoulder literally frightened some people. They were like, oh, I can't look at it. Repaint that painting. Cover those shoulders up. I'm not joking, that's a real thing. And don't even get me started on cleavage. Shoulders were previously considered to be something beautifully showcased from gowns that had both lower and wider necklines. This was considered beautiful and sexy in a good way. But with puritanical views taking over anything considered too beautiful and definitely anything considered sexy would be seen as bad and sinful. So we had to cover those shoulders up. <laughs> Man, if I traveled back to the Victorian era right now, they'd be like, girl, what you doing with those shoulders? Sorry, my shoulders and my ankles are out today. Oh, scandalous. Number eight, the gall dress. Well, Marie Antoinette was not around during the Victorian era, living and dying just before it began, really. Her presence was felt in regards to the mark that she left on the fashion scene. Marie Antoinette was often seen as a woman of scandal, not just because of the stories of her love affairs and her actually being misquoted here as responding to the poor, starving people of France by saying, let them eat cake but also because of her fashion sense. While by today's standards, Marie Antoinette would be seen as probably being overdressed among us, by her time standards, she was often seen as presenting herself as immoral, with many of her dresses resembling more 
undergarments of the day than the usual more modest finery and typical style. Case and point a portrait that was done in her chemise style dress known as a gall by painter Vigie Lebrun was condemned for how it portrayed the monarch. People actually admired Lebrun's work in terms of the painting itself but didn't like the dress that she had painted the queen in as they felt it appeared too intimate and informal. As a result the painting was actually removed from display and Vigie was forced to repaint Marie Antoinette's dress into something more formal and fitting. Cause it's just it's too risque. We were like, we can't look at the queen like this. It looks terrible. Repaint it. <laughs> I don't know why I'm making everyone British when we're in France, but there you go. <laughs> Number 7. Fainting Room By today's standards, fainting rooms might seem quite scandalous. And while they were very fashionable back in the day, often being linked to corsets, at least so we think, in reality, fainting rooms actually had less to do with corsets and more to do with people's desires to nap without having to bother with all the business of undressing, getting in bed, getting back up, having the bed remade, and completely redressing. Instead, fainting rooms were a place where you could sneak off to for some peace and quiet during a busy afternoon or major social event or simply a place you could just go to rest for a bit without having to do the whole sleep time ritual that usually accompanied, you know, going to bed. What's more scandalous is the fact that the women who were known to actually faint back in the day, that is true, and even today, women still faint, people still faint, had this malady attached to corsets by physicians. Usually, of course, men back in the day who simply just didn't know what was wrong with these women to make them faint so much. So what did they do? They blamed corsets, of course. Although to be fair, corsets are notoriously bad for your health. But still, I just love that these doctors were like, I don't know what's wrong with this woman. Corsets. They make her faints. That's what it is. Probably iron deficiency, heat, being overdressed in the heat. There's a lot of reasons why people faint. Number six, Shields Green. This dye color became super popular in the Victorian era, but is also known for being literally made out of poison. If you're worried that women of the day didn't know that at the time, uh, nah. They were actually informed on this, yet they still chose to wear this color because, I mean, it was simply too gorgeous. Hey, it's worth it. A little bit of arsenic poisoning, no problem. It did cause symptoms of arsenic poisoning among those who wore the dresses dyed with this color because I mean it's dye, it's, this fabric is still rubbing up against your skin, still getting absorbed through your pores, but it actually caused even more harm to those who made and dyed the garments with it. Cause you know, they're the ones actually breathing that in and stuff. Yikes. Number five, bloomers. Bloomers were one of the first styles of pants women gravitated towards in the Victorian era. They were worn in rebellion of the often unruly skirts of the day, which made it hard to move around and well, honestly, probably do anything. Female cyclists instead preferred to wear bloomers, causing much scandal as people felt it was improper for women to dress so masculinely. How dare you? Basically, bloomers are like more floofy pants is how I would describe them, and people felt that pants should be reserved for men to wear. Even the floofy ones. They were like, women can't have any pants, not even floofy pants. I gotta say, I would totally rock some Victorian era bloomers and be causing all the scandals myself if I were around back then. They definitely look more comfy than pretty much almost everything else women were wearing. The bloomers got their name from a prominent American feminist of the time, Amelia Bloomer, though she herself did not invent them, but she was a person that basically spoke out and was like, I, why can't women wear pants? Although Amelia Bloomer did fight hard for women's rights, she herself is not someone I believe we should just straight up glorify, to be clear. She also said some pretty terrible things about Native Americans, and she also seemed to be content with civilians taking the law into their own hands and literally hanging people deemed undesirable in their community. So it's a big yikes from me. Number four, corset. Corsets didn't originate in the Victorian era, but they definitely became iconic in regards to the fashion of that time period. That's because slim waists, they came back into fashion, baby. They also became iconic for the fact that they were causing great damage to the people wearing them. Well, I too, do love to don a corset from time to time. It is important to make sure that you don't push it when you're wearing them, and it's important to remember that this extreme form of shapewear literally has a history of moving people's insides around as a result of wearing them daily or even just regularly. Honestly, even me wearing it every now and then is not good for you. Just corsets aren't good for you. So even just wearing a corset, you know, every now and then, it's not good. 
probably shouldn't do it. I probably shouldn't do it, but am I gonna do it? Yeah, probably. And even back in the Victorian era, when they were trending again, we knew that corsets were bad for you. And it made this item quite the risque one, despite it at the time being coveted and widely used by many out there. That was actually like even a topic back then. People were like, shouldn't people be wearing these? This seems dangerous. Number three, flashing. Some ankle. <laughs> can't see it on camera. I can't show it to you because it'd be too scandalous. So scandalous. As silly as this sounds now, especially with it being summer right now, as I'm talking about this, a time when being underdressed is really just being comfortable. This was, in fact, a huge thing in the Victorian era. Women were often covered head to toe from the top of the neck all the way down to the ankles. It was common for women to even wear multiple long skirts and stockings in an attempt to just fully cover their legs and ankles. So those who decided to flash a little bit of ankle with their fashion choices, woo, they were considered quite risque. Number two, hoop skirts. As deadly as they were definitely fashionable during part of the Victorian era. The hoop skirt, also known as caged crinoline, was a type of skirt that was built like a cage. There's various different ones which were made out of different materials, but the idea is it's literally a big hoop cage that you wear and then you put a dress over top of that, or a skirt over top of that. The idea was to add volume to the bottom of your outfit, which would also help to make your waist look even slimmer. Something that was very fashionable back in the day and something still coveted by many in regards to modern beauty standards today. Hoop skirts though were deadly because you would often misjudge the size of your skirt, which could cause all kinds of accidents. Also, many of the materials used to build the hoop skirts and dresses that went over top were very flammable. Many people died from catching fire or getting their skirts caught in machinery or even carriage wheels. So yeah, don't wear a hoop skirt if you have to do anything or be, be near flames or just be alive in the Victorian era because there were open flames like everywhere. <laughs> number one, the one piece. I like that I saved this one for number one. I didn't realize I was doing that, but I knew subconsciously. The one piece swimsuit created quite the controversy when it, it came into fashion near the end of the Victorian era. And the really wild thing is it initially pretty much covered almost like your entire body. But, and it's a big but for this era, it was very fitted. So because it hugged the body, as swimwear really should do so that you can, you know, actually swim, it was considered to be quite scandalous. Not only that, but of course the one piece also wanted to maintain your modesty by not having your skirt float up in the water around you, giving everyone potentially a free show. So it was fashioned to be pants, you know? Oh boy, a woman in pants without a skirt? Scandalous. Scandalous. How dare, how dare these women try to swim? <laughs> we didn't say women could swim. Someone put a law so that these women can't swim. <laughs> Get them out of these swimsuits. Number 10, Queen Victoria. It's all blighty herself. Her Royal Majesty and Queen of the British Empire. Queen Victoria, she's responsible for a lot of things, including a nice long holiday in the summer where dads get to be irresponsible with fireworks. Nice. All fun jokes aside, she was the queen of the monarch and she wasn't the worst queen ever, but uh, during her reign, the British Empire had never really been stronger as it took part in absorbing many smaller nations into the empire. And they didn't ask nicely if you catch my drift. India, China, and uh, a lot of parts of Africa. Africa had a rough time back then. It was pretty hard for that continent. They all felt the wrath of the queen's expansionist fist. It's really sad, actually. Goddamn. Number nine, thieves. Times, specifically in Victorian London, weren't the best. It most certainly wasn't the cleanliest place on earth, and there were orphans asking for more porridge. I don't know. I didn't read the book, guys. Sorry. Lack of rights, social expectations and pressure, and a lot of double standards. Honestly, it just wasn't an easy time for women. Well, it shouldn't really come as a surprise, but thievery and pickpocketing were often done even by women, though. I mean, what, what choice do you have at that point? The idea of ladies was so ladylike or elegant that it wasn't possible, or at least people thought it wasn't possible, that they could be criminals. What a backhanded compliment. Well, a woman a criminal? I certainly don't think so, sir. It's not possible. It's very possible. There are tons of thieves and pickpockets. That's just ridiculous. Number eight, Jane Toppin. Take a trip with me to Boston. We can see Bunker Hill, Old North Church, and Fanu Hall. Ooh, cool. We could also visit a very nice nurse from the 1880s who was taking care of the elderly. Jolly Jane, as she became to be known, was a nurse who took care of the elderly. And by take care, I mean the same way you took care of your first hamster. 
Mmm, yeah, not so great, was it? Now, how did he know that? I know. She would dose up the old geezers with a healthy Keith Richards sized dose of morphine. Yeah! There's only so much rock stars that can handle that level of rock and roll. And guys, grandma and grandpa, they're not one of them. They can't handle that kind of stuff. After that, she would lay down with them and just like chill with the body, because that's, that's what you do. Ugh. Before she was caught, there was an estimated 31 grandmas and grandpas not at the dinner table after having her as a nurse. I'm just gonna lay down right beside you. It's gonna be great. I'm just gonna lay down. <laughs> Number seven, Typhoid Mary. My mom wasn't the best cook on planet Earth, but God willing, she tried. You know, she she really put in a lot of work. Excuse the meme here, but she makes a mean spaghetti though. God, I love mom's spaghetti. I really, I really do. And her cookies. Oh, she makes the best cookies. Everyone should agree with me in the comments section so I can show my mom and tell her she hasn't made cookies in a while. Tell my mom to make some cookies. It's time she makes cookies, man. They're so freaking good. They're the best on earth, I swear. Well, my mother is okay. She doesn't make up the Gordon Ramsay standards, but that's okay because no matter how well Typhoid Mary made the lamb sauce, it was always gonna make people green as Typhoid Mary was an asymptomatic carrier of typhoid fever. Yes, that's what we're talking about, Typhoid Mary. Crazy enough, after she found out that she was asymptomatic with typhoid, she insisted upon cooking. She kept going, which got more people sick. Surprise. She was forcibly quarantined multiple times in her life. You, what? you can't make this stuff up. Please stop cooking, you're sick. I'm gonna do what I want. You can't tell me what to do. Number six, Bell Star. You know, for those who enjoy adult entertainment, her name kind of sounds like it came from there, right? Anyway, she was a cowgirl and outlaw in the 1880s and in the Lone Star State. She was married to an Indian and oftentimes as a couple would offer help to other outlaws needing refuge at their ranch. In 1883, her and her husband were caught trying to steal a horse, very RDR of them, hmm, and spent time in the old slammer. They continued their outlaw ways until it all went Dutch Vanderland, meaning it didn't go very well. One day, like any other good western, a stranger had come to the ranch, kind of out of nowhere, and gave Bell Star a taste of the law. Just happened to be with a big iron. To this day, nobody knows what happened, who the stranger was, or why she was bang bang. No one, no one knows. No one, no one understands. It's crazy. There, was, there should be a movie about that. Big iron on his hip, all fancy anyway. Number five, Mary Surratt. I actually didn't know this one, but perhaps maybe our American audience remembers. Some will recall a time when America was divided in twain. After all, a house divided amongst itself cannot stand. A certain top-hatted bearded president did his best to restore the union. It took a lot of years and lives, but he managed to do it. However, some were still not pleased, a one John Wilkes Booth to be specific had to ask the president a leaded question, if you catch my drift. Well, after assassinating one of the most beloved presidents in American history, he needed to hide. You, you gotta hide after that. And Mary Surratt was the woman who'd let him hide. So I think aiding and abetting, as well as harboring the most wanted man in America at the time, counts as scandalous. She also had some other anti-union behavior as well. Hmm, that's not good. Nazi, Nazi, not very nice. Number four, Lizzie Borden. Lizzie Borden took an axe, gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. Huh, isn't that nice? <laughs> oh boy. Yes, that's right, the late 1800s teenage daughter who maybe perhaps pulled an OJ Simpson. Nah, no, we're not sure, I don't know. Maybe she did not sort of brutally unalive her families. <laughs> no one else was found at the scene, and then she was acquitted. That sounds just like OJ. Which, given how women were treated back in the day, is kind of strange, because I, it just feels like women who are clearly not guilty were punished for stuff they didn't do, and women who are for sure guilty get off free. Her alibi was that she was in the barn when it happened, and then she walked to the house and, Mom and Dad, what's going on here? Let me just wash off my bloody my bloody shorts here. What? Who did that? What? That's crazy. Number three, Mary Ann Cotton. Marriage can be tough, sure, but Mary Ann Cotton is the reason today you can't collect on life insurance when your spouse mysteriously, get your finger quotes out, mysteriously passes away. It all started when she predicted the passing of her stepson, and then it happened. Well, that's weird. After that, it was her husband here, and then another husband there, and well, it's starting to get a little fishy, don't you think? Well, once these unexpected passings were looked into, they all had something in common, something in their tummies. 
Arsenic. Yes, she was getting rid of her husbands and then trying to claim the insurance money. Evil, but ahead of her time, like 50 years ahead of her time. That's that's insurance fraud. That's interesting. And well, it's also it's also like cold-blooded, calculated, unaliving, you know. But but insurance fraud too. <laughs> Number two, Tilly Kilmick. Okay, how about a literal psychic who knew when all of our late husbands were going to pass? In the late Victorian era, Tilly Kilmick was first found predicting the passing of scruffy wild dogs in the ghettos of Chicago. It's kind of a weird thing to say, like, mm, yeah, see that dog? That dog's not gonna make it. The dog? No, he's not gonna make it. Anyway, <laughs> somehow she always knew when they were going to expire. Then it was her late husband of 29 years. That's kind of strange, 29 years, and he ends up, hmm, that's weird. After cashing the insurance money, which she got immediately, she started dating immediately, where oblivious man after man kept passing, and very shortly after she married more and more. Well, she was a regular Marianne Cotton, to say the least, as she too was using arsenic on her husband to collect insurance money. She eventually was arrested, and her stipulation for being in prison was that she was not allowed to cook for anyone. I think that's fair. That's good. Don't let her cook. Don't, that's a good idea. Number one, ladies of the evening. Love them, hate them, or spend a lot of money on them in Vegas. That's, that's, that's Las Vegas, baby. The era was defined by them, especially in London. Ooh, baby. I mean, at night, you really couldn't walk anywhere without a fair lass daintily waving her hand in hopes of luring in a customer, which wasn't really an issue given that bedroom-related sicknesses were at an all-time high. Syphilis specifically had shockingly high percentage of the population and would make you think twice. Well, it would make us think twice, it would make me think twice, but people back then, uh, they kind of just went for it. Right, is something wrong with you, love? I don't care, let's go anyway. Number 10 on the countdown is the cat's meat man or woman. We all know that the Egyptians worship cats, as many cultures do. But did you know that the cat overpopulation in the 1800s London area created a job called cat meat sellers? Always one of the most popular street sellers of the 1800s. If you think they sold cat meat, you're entirely wrong. Don't worry. These vendors were actually selling meat to cats themselves. Primarily horse, it was said that 26,000 horses that were maimed or passed their workability were slaughtered a year for London's reportedly 300,000 street cats that were existing in the 1860s. When the cat's meat seller appeared, feline owners were encouraged by their cats mewing to bestow upon their favorite pet a delectable treat for a mere half penny. You may be wondering how this could be one of the worst jobs to have. Well, pushing around a hot stinking cart of horse meat has its cons, such as disease and rot. Depending on where you sold, you could be making a fortune or you could be barely scraping by. The hungry and homeless would often fall harass and sometimes burglarize cat meat sellers for meat or money. Also their stalking behavior did scare off clientele or drew more complaints from the commoners. Personally I couldn't think of something cuter than a little trolley going around town delivering food to kittens. Prepare to go downhill however because this next job is a lot less lighthearted than cat meat delivery. Number 9. Linker boy or linker men. Before the introduction of gas lights on the streets of London, the only gas lighting came in the form of small children who made you believe that you wouldn't be able to walk the streets without them tagging along with a torch to help guide your way. Then they'd expect a tip from you. Little oh, rascals. They weren't so bad. They were generally pretty helpful in getting you from point A to point B while being able to see one foot in front of the other. And their charge was usually just one farthing, or the equivalent of a quarter. The linker boy, like a lot of the jobs on this list, was actually featured in a lot of art and literature from the time, and there were even some rather infamous ones, like Lawrence Casey, who was the personal linker boy for the courtesan Betty Careless. Oi, where are you going mate? You forgot to like and subscribe to the channel. Oh, and while I've got your attention, why not take a little peek over at our Facebook, where you'll find behind the scenes content. Get on with it! All right, all right, bloody hell, bloody hell. Number eight, knock her up. No, not like that. God, look. I despise my alarm clock. It wakes me out of my deeply deserved beauty sleep at 6 a.m. every weekday morning. Now take the alarm clock and assign that job to a real person. That person is a knocker up, a person employed to wake up workers at mills and factories on early shifts, going from house to house using a long pole to knock on bedroom windows. In other words, a person employed to become the epitome of all my hatred in this world. If you had this job, well, you're not alive anymore, but I hate you. The people at the time were somewhat friendlier than they are now, and I'm sure the knocker upper wasn't a horrible person, but I'm sure there had to be some grumpy gills who would put their hand on your chest for doing this to them. Number seven, a phrenologist. I think if this YouTube thing doesn't work out for me, I'm gonna 
go and make up a science. It worked for phrenologists. They claimed that a person's personality, character traits, and abilities could all be figured out by bumps and indents on a person's skull. Characteristics like secretiveness, amativeness, conjugality, and combativeness were apparently controlled by areas of the brain that they called organs of the brain. The idea was dismissed by the church, but it nonetheless gained traction through Europe and was really popular in the States. The idea that you could modify these organs through self-control and practice sounded really good to self-help gurus at the time, if only it was real. Number six, a dog whipper. Looking for someone who absolutely despises dogs and doesn't mind being despised by the rest of us otherwise known as a dog whipper. Back in the day, huntsmen would often hunt foxes and nail their tails to church doors, which would attract dogs of the streets. You'd also have churchgoers who would bring their dogs with them to church. These dogs were not allowed in though, so they'd all have to wait outside. You know how dogs are though. They didn't just sit there waiting patiently. I'm sure some good boys and girls did, but more often than not, they'd be playing and sometimes fighting, disrupting the church services. Enter the dog whipper, who was armed with tongs to grab a dog and remove it from the church grounds, and a whip that would be used on the loudest of the poor pooches. Number five. A rat catcher. I know this will make a few of you out there squirm in your seats. Rats in Victorian England were a massive problem. They were everywhere. Every nook and cranny of your house, from the basement to the pipes. There was even an account of them spilling over from royal parks. So of course, where there is a problem, there is a job. Rat catchers were pretty famous throughout the Victorian era and were highly praised in society, but the job wasn't too glamorous. You'd be going into the dark, dirty places where rats would make their homes and catching and often killing thousands of rats a year. Often rat catchers would use other animals like dogs and ferrets to help them hunt down the rats too. I don't know though, it's gonna be me. Number four, an upright worker. Upright workers, otherwise known as chimney sweeps, actually started off being children as young as the age of four. The smaller size of the little kiddos was perfect for fitting inside and climbing up and down chimneys. The little suckers would rub their elbows and knees up against the brick of the chimney so much that they would be scraped raw before callousing. Isn't that lovely? No. No, it's not. It's horrible. Some children were deliberately underfed to keep them small enough to do the job. Some of them would get permanent lung damage from the dust and smut and smoke from the chimney. Some kids even got stuck in the chimneys. Thank the Lord they eventually passed a law that would make it illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to be a chimney sweep. But even then, tis not a profession many would like to have. Number three, matchstick makers. The idea of a lighter wasn't really a big thing in the Victorian era. They definitely existed, as the first one was invented in 1823, but it was not exactly a portable thing. So matches were your match. The first match was invented in 1805, but it sucked. The first friction activated match came about in 1826, and they were made with white phosphorus, which is extremely toxic. But they didn't have machines to make these matches. No, it was actually mainly done by teenage girls and in the worst of conditions too. Forget protective gear. Oh, you wanna take your lunch break away from the highly toxic white phosphorus? Oh, no, no, no. That's right, these girls would have to eat their lunch at their workstations, meaning they would end up ingesting the white phosphorus. Mmm, yes, my favorite seasoning. Number two. Resurrectionists. Back in the day, medical schools who wished to study the human body only really had access to the bodies of criminals who had hit the end of the line. There actually weren't too many of these bodies around, which led to a good price for bodies that were in reasonably good condition, other than being deceased. This wasn't exactly the greatest idea, as now you've created an opportunity for people with no morals or empathy to go and dig up fresh graves, becoming resurrectionists. A cool name for an absolutely god-awful profession, if you could call it that. The problem was bad enough that people would actually guard the graves of their recently deceased loved ones. No one should have to do that. Number one, night soil man. All right, if you need me, I'll be depositing my night soil over in the toilet. Poop, night soil is poop. And the night soil man, well, you see, before we had real sewer systems, the night soil you deposited at home would go into a lovely hole in the ground. As you can imagine, these would tend to fill up over time, and that's when you have your night soil men come in. Yes, his job was to clear out the poop deposits from houses and cart it away in the middle of the night so nobody in polite society would have to see it. But they were always in business, so that makes the job a little less crappy. 
Number 10, train engine cleaner. Ever wanted to get inside a small hole in the engine of a train and shovel out the coal that was left in there? Ever wanted to go underneath a train where you can't fully stand up in the middle of the night and rake out a dusty ash pan, getting all kinds of ash and stuff in your mouth? Perfect! You can go join up with the railroad as a train engine cleaner. These guys would spend their days shoveling five to six tons of coal into the furnace of the steam trains, and then spend their nights climbing into said furnace, cleaning it out, and then going out in the middle of the freezing cold, wet night into a trench covered in water and oil and dust, and get right up under that sucker and pull out all the ashes and dust and crap that came out of the engine while it had been running all day. Number Number nine, the linkerman. Before the introduction of gas lights on the streets of London, if you were traveling alone at night, well, you'd probably get lost. Because, yeah, even London now would get lost, you know what I mean? So that's where a linkerman would ideally come into play. They'd come in to save your night. What they would do is they would carry with them a torch to help guide your way home. They'd be like, hey, follow me, I know these streets, and then you'd do it, I guess. It's a little scary. At the end of this impromptu tour, they'd of course expect a little tip from you. Of course, of course, thank you for lighting my path and getting me home, cheers. Here's one nickel, it's actually a lot back then. Here's one penny, there we go. They weren't so bad, they were generally pretty helpful in getting you from point A to B, whilst also being able to see one foot in front of the other, that doesn't hurt, especially in Victorian London. You get to step on a dirty rat, that'll be gross. It's like a friend walking you home, only you don't know them, and it's the Victorian era, so probably pretty unsafe. 50-50 if you're gonna make it. And their charge was usually one farthing or the equivalent of a quarter. The linker man, like a lot of the jobs on this list, was actually featured in a lot of art and literature from that era. And there were even a couple famous linker men, famous linker mans, like Lawrence Casey, for example, who was the personal linker boy for the courtesan Betty Careless. Imagine that, your arm must be so strong with that lamp all day. Ooh, it's just like, oh, I can't put it down. Number eight, ghost photography. 1800s ghost photography. Apparently it was a theme or a, a vibe, I don't know, but there are people that would take the photos of these ghosts. So at one point you would be hired as a professional ghost photographer. On paper, here's your tax returns, that's what I did. The camera of course was a hot new invention back then, so tales of ghost and spirit were easily believed. Especially when you have a photo of a see-through woman. That probably helps sell your tail for sure. Like, up oh, here she is. It's like that's that's mom. That's definitely not. You just did that in the back room. That's I don't believe you. A big name in the ghost game was that of William Thomas Stead. He was born in 1849, so now he's for sure a ghost. Stead was the son of a Congregationalist minister, and at the age of 22, he was appointed as editor of the Northern Echo, which was a regional newspaper in Darlington. Yeah, this British medium Richard Borsonal featured a photo of W. T. Stead and a spirit. Imagine that, imagine a day where somebody was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize and they also posed for photo ops with ghosts. Like, can we pick a lane, science or not? What are we doing here? Number seven, grave designs. Graves, but make them cool, you know? Customize your own pit in the ground. That's fun, that's grim. In the late 1700s, cholera, bacterial infections, pretty much anything floating around your mouth and eyes, it was spreading and it was bad. Not a good thing to ingest. Not an ideal time in history. Many were biting the bullet at this time, of course, being gravely ill. But with this came a dark new fun trend. Yeah, here we go. The safety coffin. Yeah, let's uh, make your own coffin, DIY. These coffins, God forbid, you were buried alive while these safety coffins would allow the dead to rise again. Yeah, some Tony Stark guy in the back's like, if you push this, the body will pop back out and come to life. It's like, really? A lot of these coffins were built with extra comfort on the inside and of course, a wire, the safety backup wire. This wire ran through the coffin, through the ground, and attached to a bell on the outside on the ground. So if somebody was walking by and they heard a bell ringing beside a gravestone, first of all, it's haunting, well, they know that something's up and they can get them out. But folks would get creative with their safety coffins. They would ask the inventor to make them crazy things, like a man named Robert Robinson from Manchester. He had some odd requests. He passed away in 1791, but he instructed his family and watchmen to open the special door on his coffin after he passed. This special door would reveal a layer of glass. Yeah, so if anybody saw any condensation, well, you know, he's still alive and get him out. Only he wasn't alive. And now we just have the world's scariest exhibit, just a real life dead man. Let's close that back up forever. I don't want a glass coffin, that's disgusting. Number six, rat catcher. I mean, obviously you know what's gonna happen with the name the rat catcher. It's gonna make a lot of you out there squirm in your seats and I apologize in advance. Hit that thumbs up, you know, let's even out the energy. Rats in Victorian England, 
they were a massive problem. They were everywhere. Every nook and cranny of your home probably had a dirty, fat rat just sitting there with its weird teeth looking at you. From the basement to the pipes, everywhere. It was literally a, it was a big problem. There was even an account of them spilling over from royal parks. So imagine that. So of course, there's a problem. So of course, where there's a problem, there's now a job, right? Someone's got to do something about it. Rat catchers were pretty famous throughout the Victorian era. I mean, of course, brave souls. And they were highly praised in society, but the job, obviously, wasn't too glamorous. You'd be going into dark, dirty places where rats would make their homes and we'd catch them and you'd often have to kill thousands of rats every single year. And then deal with that. I don't even know how you deal with those bodies. Let's say bones, ew. More often than not, rat catchers would use other animals like dogs and ferrets to help them hunt down the rats, so. You have your own little animal posse hunting down other animals. You would feel pretty good. You'd feel like a, the king of animals almost. Probably not, eh? It's probably a disgusting job. You probably hate it every day. Number five, matchstick makers. The idea of a lighter wasn't really a big thing back in the Victorian era, obviously. I mean, they definitely existed. The first lighter was invented in 1823, but it wasn't like the ones we have now. Not like those Bix that still don't work. It wasn't a portable thing. The first match was invented in 1805, but it kind of sucked. And the first friction activated match came around much later in 18. 1926. This one here changed the game for good. They were made with white phosphorus, which is, of course, extremely toxic. But they didn't have machines to make these matches. No, it was, of course, done by people, young women. It was only women that had to do this, and in the worst of conditions, of course. And before you ask, no, they didn't understand protective gear. Well, they did a bit, but even so, women didn't get that kind of luxury, right? They didn't get that treatment. These girls would have to eat their lunch at their workstations, meaning they would probably end up ingesting said white phosphorus the entire shift. History is horrible. Number four, resurrectionalist. All right, back in the day, medical schools who wished to study the human body only really had access to the bodies of criminals who had hit the end of their line, right? You're not gonna go dig up someone's wife and be like, hey, mind if I study her? He's like, no, please. There actually weren't too many of these bodies around to begin with, which led to a good price for bodies that were in, well, reasonably good condition to, you know, study up close, other than being, you know, deceased and disgusting. This wasn't exactly the greatest idea, sure, I'll admit that. Now you've probably created an opportunity for people with no morals or empathy to go and dig up fresh graves. And that's exactly what happened. People would become their own resurrectionalist. It's a cool name for a god-awful profession if you want to call it that. The problem was so bad that people had to protect, like they had to guard the graves of their recently deceased loved ones. Or else these guys would come in and try and dig them up and sell your Nana for like 20 bucks. You have to stay there for four nights and guard her. That's great. No one should have to do that. The Victorian era sucked. No one should have to do that or this next one here. Number three, train engine cleaner. Yeah, this one's gonna suck. It sounds yucky already. For this job, you were required to get into, of course, pretty tough positions to, well, clean the engine of a train. Train engine cleaners would have to get inside a small hole in the engine of a train and shovel out all that coal that was left over. Yeah, as if shoveling the coal in wasn't bad enough, now some guy's gotta crawl under and shovel it all out. Nope. They go underneath the train with a dusty ash pan and they work away all day long and nights. These guys would spend their days shoveling five to six tons of coal into the furnace of the steam trains and then spend their nights climbing into the same furnace to clean it out. Every time I watch the Polar Express, it's always so magical, you know, it's always a great time. But even on the Polar Express, there's a guy shoveling coal all night long on Christmas Eve. You know what I mean? That's how bad this job is. Magic can't even save it. Couldn't even picture a worse job to have with this goofy back. Imagine that, imagine me doing this all day. No way, I'm gonna make it one week. Number two, funeral mute. Ah uh, yes, death. Happened quite a lot back then. I thought being a pallbearer had a lot of pressure, you know, don't drop them, hmm? all that kind of stuff. Victorian London saw many, many funeral mutes. Now Oliver Twist, one of the lousy jobs in that tale was that of a funeral mute. Oliver Twist is like, this one sucks, one really sucks. Mutes were required to dress, of course, in all black with a sash while carrying a long cloth covered stick and your job would be to, well, to stand and mourn and not say a thing the entire time. You'd have to stand at the door of the recently deceased home and just welcome death. Just embrace it, you have to be death. The mascot for death is now you. Horrible. In Victoria, London too, you're gonna breathe in a fresh rotting body. Nice, that's good. I have about four days left, thank you. And after that point, you would lead the coffin all the way to the graveyard, nice and slow, like you were uh, leading a marching band. Only it's not music, it's death behind you. And finally, number one, a chimney sweep. I remember doing this when I was a kid. Okay, I got some questions now. I'm gonna make some phone calls after this list. I had to do this when I was a kid, but back then it was a lot worse. It wasn't a chore, it was an actual job. This was a terrible job to have in Victorian London, obviously. Chimney sweeps were famously young men, guys. I can't say anything else here, but they were young lads. That's it. History is pretty horrible, right? 
you could fill it in. 1840 was a good year, all things considered, because a law was passed that made it officially illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to climb in and clean a chimney. Nice, I was 18 cleaning my chimney at home. I had no idea, I could have busted out this law and been like, actually, three more years, dad. See ya, just moonwalk out of there. I'm not cleaning anything, just the kitchen for now. I'm not using that tiny little brush. Why do all chimney sweeps have a tiny brush? Give them a bigger brush, you know? Number 10, Queen Victoria's passing. Some say it ended the Victorian era, but it actually kind of extended a little while past that. She was the longest reigning queen at the time and a symbol of Great Britain's power. She also wasn't the nicest. Uh, she oversaw the conquering of India, which pretty bad. The special flower wars in China, which saw China give five of its major cities to the British Empire, including Hong Kong, which kind of an awkward one there too. So yeah, her passing was sad for most, but for others, especially foreign nations, it was a reminder that the brutal overseers are still there and they're probably still gonna rule for another like 70 years. Oof. Looking for a less noisy affair, more somewhere to chat, but also be entertained? Why, how about the music halls? Even more popular for their variety of singing, contortionists, illusionists, animal tamers, trick cyclists, ballet girls, and more. These emerged in the 1850s, and by the 1870s, there were hundreds across Britain. The audiences chatted throughout the acts, and they could be unruly, throwing things at performers like bottles, old boots, vegetables, and even dead cats. In some halls, bottles carried by waiters were chained to the trays, and the orchestra was protected from flying objects by steel grills. While women initially weren't allowed in the middle class song and supper rooms, they were later encouraged to attend because people hoped that they would have a civilizing influence on the men. Who, who thought that? That's not why women wanted to go. Anywho, throughout the 1860s, it became more common for women to perform in music halls themselves. Many married into aristocracy because of it, got hired onto big performers, and went to or ended up modeling for magazines. Through topical songs, music halls played the political edge and kept their audiences informed and educated about their rights and about the current social, economic, and political issues or corruptions. The last two decades of the 19th century saw steady efforts to control and regulate music halls, with music regulation, performer regulation, enforcement measures to reduce alcohol in worker and worker girls, and slowly introducing higher paying audience. And since I mentioned alcohol, the Victorian era was one of mixology. Many of the cocktails we drink now we owe to the British advent, and mixology historians consider the time of the mid 1800s to prohibition to be the golden age of mixology. Cocktail bars today use recipes and techniques that derive or replicate what the Victorians used in mix. The term cocktail began to be used in the very late 1700s, with the first workable definition printed in 1806. The popular mixed drinks of the time were punches and warm spice drinks served in large quantities rather than individually prepared drinks. Industrialization and changing societal norms came the rise of the cocktail because more available ingredients, the availability of ice, and the societal change seeing men and women working class aristocratic socializing together in public. So emerged career bartenders. One of the first people to make a name for himself was the hotshot bartender Jerry Thomas. He's so responsible for creating the trend he's considered the father of American mixology. In fact, there was a gin craze of the 18th century and it highlights the Brits love of cocktails. The consumption of gin in Great Britain, especially London, was so high parliament passed five Five major acts in 1729, 36, 43, 47, and 51 designed to control the consumption of gin. Whether at home, the music halls, or the dirty smoggy streets, the Brits loved a good novel. Print culture in Victorian era was diverse, aided by relatively high literacy rates. There were hundreds of magazines and newspapers available at cheaper prices, so even the most lowly and humble could enjoy some writing, even if it was subpar entry level crap. The 1880s saw the emergence of the new journalism, which drew in readers with pieces of violent crimes and scandals in high society, aka the true crime podcast of the times. Then novels were a key feature of the Victorian print culture. By mid-century, Britons of all classes could afford and read novels. Some were aimed at the highly educated and well-off people, others at less educated readers looking for appealing and exciting stories. Penny dreadfuls and sensation novels seen at their best in the work of Wilkie Collins thrilled their readers, and Victorian novels were often long with complicated plots and many characters. Many of those by by Charles Dickens are still read today, and the Penny Dreadfuls made it to the TV screen in the masterful three season TV drama. You guys should check it out. And where better to read my newest Mary Shelley horror than my bestest painted office filled with taxidermy. The Georgian era was one of rationalism, but a shift in ideology took place as this period transitioned into the Victorians. Their view aligned more so with the Romantics, who were intrigued with by mysticism and death. So while they were a time of technological advancement and progress, culturally 
Victorians were prone to bizarre habits and beliefs. Like when a human family member passed away, Victorians did an extensive mourning ceremony. Like take pictures with the dead, sometimes wear black for years, sob and roll on the ground. So when a family pet passed away, it's not that much different, and it's common to hire a taxidermist to preserve the animal, giving them a second life, which reflects the Victorian belief that animals should be useful to humans even in death. Walter Potter was a celebrated celebrity English taxidermist, known for his dioramas of animals mimicking real life situations. Also famously known for not being an who killed his animals to create art, but rather receiving donations from local farmers to do so. In 1861, Potter opened his own museum to showcase his creations, and it remained popular until the early 19th century when people began raising questions about how ethical taxidermy was. Victorians actually liked to collect weird stuff so much they made curiosity cabinets. Victorians were curious people with an interest in nature, the sciences, anatomy, botany, and morbidity. And for the upper class citizens, collecting scientific objects showed they were sophisticated and educated educated, often displaying their collections in a curiosity cabinet. These German cabinets were a way for the wealthy to show off their hobby. Oftentimes, beautiful wooden display cases with elaborate carvings and glass fronts, or a larger, narrow, open shelving style bookcase. Curiosity cabinets were usually kept in places where guests could see them to stir conversations about the pieces. And collecting was a social activity that allowed you to share your interests and also show off what you knew in a humble manner. Many curiosity cabinets were eclectic, filled to the brim with unrelated mixed oddities. Although most collectors were not formally trained, this never deterred anyone and even working class people started collecting items like buttons, fetishes, pocket sized portraits, stones and animal bones. Death, insect and human oddity photographs were as popular as Pokemon. Even oddity performers made business cards called carte de viste, a small photograph card collectible of themselves. Joseph Merrick, a professional showman known as the Elephant Man, was a popular carte de viste. And he worked for the next topic on the list. The freak shows. It was a weirdly massive part of the Victorian culture, described as a family friendly commercial event. They were the entertainment pinnacle. The name itself is offensive, and many Victorians, even then, boycotted the shows for its mockery and ableism. But the shows acted as a source of solace for performers that were often disabled or had genetic differences that made them potentially rejectable from society and potentially their own families. In the Victorian era, asylums were hellish, and if that was your option or a job in the circus, many made the choice to live in a welcoming community of similarly ostracized people with differences. Siamese twins, extra limbs, excessive hair growth, malformation, and many married and had children and functioning lives of normalcy despite making a living performing for audiences as freaks. Their stories embody the magnificent resiliency of human spirit and they make a killing off the lustuous need for weirdness in the Victorian era, emptying wallets of people who wouldn't accept them outside of a show ring and living more financially secure than they did. The show started in the 1500s but hit their boom in the 1800s, and the best performers were often found in Queen Victoria's own court. Some famous names were Millie and Christine McCoy, John Merrick, Fanny Mills, Prince Rondian, and Ella Harper. Next up is how Victorian oddity obsession literally irreparably destroyed a ton of history. Egyptomania. It began in 1798 with the launch of Napoleon's campaigns in Egypt and Syria, a fitting example of imperialism when they find the Rosetta Stone. Europe goes on a mission to proliferate and appropriate any and all Egyptian antiquity or aesthetic culture vulture style. The Egyptian obsession consumed Western thought, revealing itself through their literature, art, and culture at the time. This included their mummy unwrapping parties and novels such as Arthur Conan Doyle's Lot 249, and also their decor. Anyone who could afford to travel to Egypt could realistically afford to buy a mummy because they kind of sold them at bazaars like Barbies at Walmart. When it came to mummy unwrapping parties, Victorians let their intrigue cloud their, let's see, judgment, human decency, morals, conscious, man, am I missing anything? It was a form of entertainment that was a complete desecration of Egypt, its people, and their ancestors. Thomas Pettigrew, who was a surgeon, antiquary, and an author, was a well-known unroller at one notable gathering for the unwrapping of Neshkins. The second wife of Thebian high priest Pio Jem II was placed in a contraption that made her appear to dance. The demand for mummies to take home was so high that Egyptians even started transporting them from less visited ruins to areas that got more traffic. Hundreds are now lost, as are their tomb locations. 
citizens. These gatherings thankfully died out in the later years of the 19th century, not because Victorians realized their inhumanity, but because of boredom. Because the Victorians were greedy, nothing filled their interest for very long, except occult and spiritualism. They put that bleep in everything books, newspapers, clothes, art, decor, parties. The modern spiritualism movement was generally agreed to start on April 1st of 1848 in Hydesville, New York, when teen sisters claimed to speak to a ghost of a man killed in their home. News that spread worldwide and that had a complete fascination chokehold on England, causing the spiritualism movement of the 1860s and attracting people from different social classes, including Queen Victoria. The most popular forms of occult interest in the late Victorian period include mesmerism, clairvoyance, electrobiology, crystal gazing, specialty newspapers, public seances, thought reading, and above all else, conjuring. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, like many late Victorians, was fascinated by the possibility of communication with the departed souls. The core belief of their spiritualism movement was that the living could communicate with the dead through the help of a medium endowed with the supernatural gift during the mysterious and entertaining seance phenomena or performance. Charlatans will always take advantage after all. Within the late Victorian counterculture of spiritualism, a number of women and men gained fame and authority as skilled mediums. And now for the original garden gnome, the dirty old man in the backyard. See this? This is a gnome. If you're a basic B word, you might consider just tossing one of these among your flowers and calling it a day. No, you want this. See this? This is the dirty old dude that you would hire to live menacingly in your backyard. Why? I don't I don't know. Why not? I I don't have an answer for you. So yeah, uh, in the Victorian era, 18th century, wealthy families hired people to don full hermit garb, complete with robes, long hair, beards, and as Campbell cites from an advertisement in 1797, hermit is never to leave of the place or hold a conversation with anyone for seven years during which he's neither to wash himself or cleanse himself in any way whatever, but is to let his hair and nails on both hands and feet grow as long as nature will permit them. These hired hermits would then lodge in shacks, caves, and other hermitages constructed on the homeowner's property, a rustic fairy tale manor or a creepy, I don't really know. It was a practice mostly found in England, although it made it up to Scotland and over to Ireland as well. But it originates in Rome. Emperor Hadrian had one of these at his villa in Tivoli as a thinking lodge, as did Pope Pius III. From there, it gradually verged away from religious devotees seeking isolation for themselves for spiritual reflection to a stinky dude lodging for an 18th century profession. It might seem like a whimsical garden feature, but it was all about that most celebrated Georgian England emotion, melancholy. Introspection and somberness of spirit were prized amongst the elite, and rules that they asked the hermits to play embodied this because they weren't able to do it themselves. The ornamental hermit vanished at the end of the 18th century to be replaced by these ugly little monstrosities. So go stomp on a gnome today, everyone. Kicking off the list at number 10, a lot of hair. To kick off this wild part two, I had to include the tale of the woman who ate her own hair. Why did she do it? What happened? How much hair? Well, let's find out. All the questions about to be answered. The Liverpool Daily Post back in 1869 got the attention of those passerbyers with this one. A 30 year old passed away in the village of Lincolnshire. That's not too far off from the average life expectancy in the 1800s. But this case, this case was a little odd. Something was off about it. So doctors asked the family if they could carry out a post mortem. And lo and behold, a two pound solid chunk of hair was sitting in her stomach. It caused ulcerations of the stomach and ultimately caused her death. What a horrible way to go out. The woman's sister didn't know that over the last dozen years or so, she had been casually eating her own hair. Just one piece every now and then. Ultimately, it added up. If you know anybody that's eating their own hair, pass this on. Send them this video. This sounds rather uncomfortable. Number nine in the countdown is women and their flirty fans. When you see a gentleman caller across the room, you may want to send him a hint that you're picking up the vibe that his top hat is putting out. What better way than subliminal messaging with an item you're already carrying. In Victorian times, women carried fans due to fainting spells, which were really just the result of their excessively tight and heavy garments, something we'll cover later in the video. In 1827, a fan maker from Paris, Double Roy, published a leaflet explaining the language behind the uses of a fan. Some examples were twirling the fan in the right hand meant that I love another. Meanwhile, drawing the fan across the cheek told someone special that I love you. A fan half opened and pressed to the lips gave permission for a kiss. However, 
However, it is rumored that the less romantic truth is that the fan etiquette, such as Duval Roy's leaflet, was invented in order to boost the sales of fans in the 19th century after they had fallen out of fashion following the French Revolution. Irregardless of rumors, it appears in olden times some people were using fans to get hot rather than cool down. Speaking of keeping it cool, next in our countdown at number eight is bottomless underwear. While showing a bit of ankle may have made you a harlot, in the Victorian era, every woman was walking around with crotchless undergarments. But these strange underoos were invented with a justified purpose. Due to the amount of fabric layers, steel crinolines, and tight bodices and dresses, women of the era didn't really have time to spend an hour undressing before nature calls. By creating undergarments that had holes aligned with the wearer's groin, a woman's only mission would be to hoist up as many layers as she could before popping a squat. Don't be fooled, however, that wasn't exactly easy either. Some of you may wonder what happened if Aunt Flo paid a visit while a woman was wearing an open bottom undergarment? Well, in Victorian times, menstruation hygiene was perceived very different, and women quite literally let it flow. If you want to learn more, search that one up on your own. As fashion evolved and women wore fewer and lighter clothes in the early 20th century, pulling down undergarments from underneath bustles and cages was no longer a nightmare, so the crotchless undergarment was soon abandoned once more. But now it does make sense why everyone loved the high kicking can can dancers in 19th century Paris. Morning garb, and I don't mean pajamas, is number seven in our countdown. Known as the monarch of mourning, Queen Victoria influenced how grieving women dressed and behaved in Europe and the United States after the passing of her husband in 1861. She famously mourned him for 40 years until her own demise and started what's now known as the Victorian mourning etiquette. Victorian mourning etiquette came with elaborate rituals to commemorate their dead. It became normal to have incredibly elaborate and lavish funerals, curtail social behavior, and even erect statues and ornate monuments as tombstones. Mourning clothes were part of this and they were introduced for both sexes. Set to show a family's outward display of their inner feelings after the passing of a loved one, the rules for who wore what and for how long were complicated and often outlined in popular journals or household manuals. Call that a mourner's magazine. Jokes aside, men definitely had it a lot easier. They simply wore their usual dark suits along with black gloves, hat bands, cravats, or ties. For women, especially should she be a widow, there were different levels of mourning and garb to wear as you progressed out of deep mourning and into lighter mourning and so forth. Deep mourning uh, was of course black, but also made specifically was a crepe styling, a scratchy silk with a puffed crimped appearance associated with mourning as it doesn't pair with any other clothing. Right. The mourner would eventually stop donning the crepe and then stop donning black. This was called slightening the mourning before cloth colors eventually moved on to gray, mauve, then white until the mourning period was considered complete. Number six in our countdown is the human hair wearers. Fun because it rhymes, but creepy for a whole slew of reasons. So what do I mean by human hair wearers? Well, it was a tradition in Victorian era to don jewelry that had segments of human hair embossed, woven, or sealed into it. But for many Victorian people, the amount of hair involved in remembering loved ones went far beyond a little lock in a necklace. In stores and women's magazines, you could find patterns for wreaths made of hair and wire, often floral designs. Bracelets, brooches, earrings, and necklaces were also all very common. In its prime, human hair, jewelry, and decor was considered incredibly fashionable. It's even said that swapping locks of hair was a love token between women-loving women or friends the way that girls today might wear friendship bracelets with each other. I guess if you need a trim and you were already late on a birthday gift, you could really just kill two birds with one stone. Number five in the countdown is all about buggy dresses. The wealthy Victorians were very into the grandeur, looking to feed a fascination with culture especially. Beetle wing embroidery was at a peak of fame in the 18th century India and was quickly appropriated by English visitors while military occupied the country from 1858 to 1946. A litra, which is the hard casing over a beetle's wing, first appeared on dresses and experienced their first burst of popularity in England by the 1820s, though English women in India had likely been donning it since at least the 1780s. Material used was often white or other pale colors to help augment the reflective green tones of the beetle wing. This visual was made possible when a litra was paired with zardozi, a gold embroidery style often done on colored cottons or silks. Victorians at least didn't appropriate everything about the Art form. They made patterns and styles of their own for the dresses. Elytra was sewn onto the gowns in an imitation of live beetle patterns, a reflection of Victorian interest in naturalism and zoology. Not sure why anyone wants to look like they have live bugs crawling on them, but 
Okay. Number four is the casual ball gown. One of the most notable shifts in Victorian time was that fashion began to be differentiated by gender rather than class. This reflected the changing rules of women in society. And let me say, every part of Victorian women's fashion seems tortuous. You start your day layering on long, crotchless underwear and tunics before strapping a metal cage to your waist. You then wear an average of six skirts over that, alongside bodices and corsets that would forever change the placement of your organs and potentially even suffocate you to death. The reported average weight of a Victorian dress when fully on could be anywhere between 14 and 22 pounds. But the risk doesn't end there. In fact, it was everywhere. It was estimated that between the 1850s and 1860s, 3,000 women in England died from their crinolines catching fire, as airy fabrics and hoop-supported skirts also allowed for plenty of air to circulate beneath a dress, which could also make a small flame grow out of control in seconds. In 1860s, the New York Times reported that 40,000 women worldwide perished from dress related fires. Another common occurrence was to see them pulled into machinery after walking too close and having some of the skirts catch in exposed parts. Yikes. It's no wonder that the large ball gown crinolines phased out in the late 1800s, but then bustles came in and they were worse in different ways. While more practical as it was slim on the sides and the front, it required women to sacrifice movement and comfort in order to achieve a fashionable shape like the course it did. They began to alter women's spines, ribs, and organs over time as they required women to twist their bodies completely in order to be able to sit down. Overall, while movies and TV may make these beautiful gowns seem whimsical and ethereal, they truly were just death traps. Number three in the countdown is bird brained. I enjoy my puns, but there's a reason for that one. This trend was started by the notorious Marie Antoinette, a rebel in the French courts for her outlandish fashion and accessories. Amongst her pile of powdered curls, Marie Marie was often seen with feathered caps and bonnets. While this look became an envy for women across America and Europe, the trend did struggle to take off initially as much of the aristocracy was perturbed by it. However, a trend is a trend, and eventually the English society was persuaded. They donned mainly ostrich, pheasant, or peacock feathers at first, eventually entire songbirds were stuffed after their death and adorned these hats. By the late 1800s, the plume trade had decimated several species of birds, including flamingos, birds of Paradise and rosy spoonbirds. Topping the endangered list were the snowy and great egrets, as at one point their pure white feathers were worth more than gold. Promoters of the feather trade knew what they were doing and also knew that the public didn't understand the carnage that their fashion was sieging on these animals. They held that wearing feathers and whole birds brought city dwellers closer to nature, that it improved people's awareness and knowledge of bird species. Thankfully, it's due to the inevitable public awareness and then disapproval that bird hat sales diminished and went out of trend altogether. Number two slot in the countdown is Paris Green. It seemed Parisian aristocracy had a chokehold on the globe with their trends. It's believed Empress Eugenie was to have worn a dress so stunning at the Paris Opera one evening in 1864 that it was featured in newspapers globally the next day. It was a deep yet vibrant green, one rumored to almost glow in darkness. The green of Paris quickly became the hue of the social elite. So how was Paris green made and why was it so dangerous? The color was discovered when chemists combined copper and arsenic poison. The result was a dye brighter than all the other greens available on the market. Copper wasn't what gave this color its iconic nickname however. Arsenic is a highly hazardous substance that causes skin sores, vomiting, diarrhea, and in some circumstances cancers or death, as we know now. But they didn't. When factory workers arms and hands began to wilt away from sores and decay that could only be connected to the dye, French and German guys governments enacted legislation prohibiting the production of arsenic based pigments. It's the right thing to do. Meanwhile, the British government mainly ignored them. Even when Matilda Schreuer famously died of arsenic poisoning with the whites of her eyes stained green from her working in factories. This was deemed accidental poisoning by the government at the time. Paris green remained popular in England until ironically it just went out of trend. It's a little bit of an abrupt ending honestly. No justice for those exposed in workplaces or compensation for suffering. But nothing takes the cake quite like the Victorian trend of looking dead, which is number one in our countdown. You'd figure people look dead enough as is inhaling arsenic and mercury from their clothes and shoes and hats constantly, let alone their home decor. But looking dead was the fashion of the day. This look was specifically modeled after how tuberculosis affected you. Pale skin, watery eyes, red lips. While this disease was decimating the lower status, higher status women recreated it with makeup and arsenic consumption. 
You heard me right. In order to get pale skin, women consumed arsenic. In order to not die from arsenic, the consumer had to follow a careful process, eating small doses to build up a tolerance. Now, arsenic is addictive, so if they at any point stopped the consumption, they would experience withdrawals such as vomiting, stomach pains, convulsions, hair loss, nervous system failure, kidney failure, delusions, the list goes on. Some women were stuck taking it for the rest of their lives. For the desired watery eye look, women would put citrus or even perfume in their eyes. Some went farther, using belladonna flower, also known as deadly nightshade, for longer lasting tears. However being poisonous, little wonder why blindness was a widely reported as a symptom of belladonna drops. No wonder it did such a good job. Red lip paint included? You guessed it, more poison. In this case, usually lead. All of these poisonous products would contribute to illnesses and facial decay. Death was of course a long term side effect of the usage once poisoning reached its crescendo. Suffice to say, while you may really want to fit in, some trends are not worth getting on board for, especially if they'll slowly melt your face off. Number 10. Mudlarks. Victorian London. Around the 1840s, it was a bit of a mess. Yeah, a lot of sore throats, that's for sure. Everybody was sick all the time and the jobs that were available certainly did not help the cause. The jobs that were available had you catching rats and crawling into sewers. One of the worst jobs to have was that of a mudlark. As their name hints towards, a mudlark involved getting in deep in the muck that builds up alongside the Thames River. This one was reserved for younger folks, obviously, because it was like working in quicksand. If you were older, you would just get trapped. It was pretty sad. It was also exhausting, not to mention the chances of being washed away by the river were pretty high. All for the slim chance of finding a pocket watch, driftwood, rags, anything really worth your troubles. Number nine, act like a lady. How dare ladies do anything unladylike? Ugh, said every man ever in the Victorian era. This is a time in history when ladies gotta be ladylike. That means makeup, corsets, and, and don't you dare do anything masculine. Ugh. That's me angry. This is still a time when food isn't the greatest either, so imagine if you got an upset tummy at the dinner table. Happens to me a lot. You've got a handsome prince that your parents have arranged for you to marry. When you go to greet him, you do it with a simple gesture as kneeling to curtsy could turn your linens a certain shade of embarrassment that 1800 stain cleaning technology could never wash away. You'd poop yourself. Where's Billy Mays when you need him, right? How dare women do such things as go number two, or even worse, break wind. Oh, the nerve. That's just the way it went, folks. I don't make the rules. Number eight, charged with love. Naturally, this was the past, and not being open to homosexuality was just the way it was. Especially when tucking yourself into bed at night alone wasn't allowed either. Homosexuality just wasn't gonna happen. They, they just weren't gonna be approved of it. It's just how it goes. It sucks. However, it's almost as if there's been love on this earth since day one, and to stop that kind of love, it's just silly, man. Wherever I go, everyone is welcome on this channel or my Twitch. Chetty loves everyone because in reality, this is a time period where you could wind up in jail for that kind of love. And as Awesome Powers would say, that's just not very groovy, baby. Yeah. Strangely enough, homosexual relationships between women might have been completely overlooked as they were sometimes mistaken for women being friends. Yeah, I know. Some women even lived together. But given that they probably needed each other for financial support, people just kind of thought that's how it went and they ignored it. It's like they live together and you start putting the pieces together and it's like, you know, they, I don't know, something weird going on there. But love everybody, come on, be nice. Number seven, a good thing. If I'm talking about medieval times, there's a good chance I'm gonna bring up the super not cool, not fun, do not condone or support the behavior of marrying a woman at the age of 12. Yucky. In part one, I mentioned that there was a ton of corners and streets being worked by the only other job besides street cleaners at 3 a.m. by women. However, after venereal disease was becoming a serious issue, it was getting pretty bad. It was becoming clear that a lot of people who were getting sick were young women. Like, 11 to 16 age group. Oof. Which I shouldn't have to tell you is bad. That, that's pretty bad, dude. When I was 16, I was rocking Black Ops 2, hanging out with my buddies, and partying hard in the summer. I got a lot of good stories. Maybe I'll share them one day. Catching all that nasty stuff is no way to spend your youth. So thank God the government changed the age of consent to 16 years old, which I know is not a solution for everything that was going on, but it was a small step forward in the right direction. That's what we like. Good history moving forward. We like that. Chetty likes. Number six, the seam seamstress. 
Being that the industrial revolution had started and business was booming, people needed to travel for business. Or more specifically, men needed to travel for business. Which means they gotta be away from their wives and that means they are away from the very thing we're talking about today. Bedroom stuff. How did men solve this issue? Well, there was no shortage of ladies roaming street corners to uh, aid in, in that matter. However, there's an option with a little less syphilis. There were AIDS or early blow up dolls called travel ladies. Strangely enough, it was stored in a gentleman's hat. What? That's so wrong. Once it was ready to be used, it was inflated and reassembled. This is a quote from an ad from one of the products. It is inflated to the essential part of the woman wanted by a man. That just, that just doesn't sound very good. This is why we have boards of people to check stuff from products before it gets shipped out to the public. I feel like that just wouldn't fly very well today. Number five. Big polluter. This just doesn't make any sense. It never did to me. And it still doesn't. But in case you didn't know, self pleasure was a big no no. Commonly called self pollution, which honestly is very funny to me. That's just hilarious. Don't self pollute yourself, Chris. That's bad. Don't do that. That's naughty. It was a sin and thought to be a cause for many ailments. I'm sure you've heard the classic saying that for guys, if you decided to go bump in the night by yourself, there's a good chance you'd need a walking stick because it would make you go blind. Women were also targeted, however, as for any pearl polishing by women was thought to be hysteric and needed to be treated for such. Look, the truth is, any man who wants to wax his carrot or woman tuning a one dial radio should be able to do so without judgment of society or medical remedies of snake oil doctors. Love yourself, love everybody else, and just as long as the bedroom doors close, you're good. Just, just don't do it in public, you're good. Number four, shake and bake. I'm something of a scientist myself, but that doesn't mean I know everything. And if you actually need to learn something about health and safety, take it from a professional, not a second rate John Candy. However, when coming across this fact, I just had to share it. Cause with my medical knowledge, this just doesn't sound right. All right, so kids, we know how they're made. I don't need to go into detail for that. However, there was this idea back in the Victorian days that if a woman danced shortly after doing what mommy and daddies do, then there was a chance that her pregnancy just wouldn't happen. Or perhaps more commonly after riding a horse. S same idea, uh, okay. Which is frankly, horse. I mean, come on, my mom always told me when she was baking that I had to be quiet and stop running around the house or the cake she was baking wouldn't rise. Well, they always did. I love chocolate cake. I mean, really, I do. I'm starting to wonder if there's a connection here. I was a rowdy kid. Number three, the Kensington system. Poor Queen Victoria. I know this is kind of a stretch, but it relates back to the whole mistreating women thing. But basically, it was something implemented in order to control the young royal, make her dependent on her mother, whom she was not allowed to be without. Basically, modern day strict parents. Now, all the kids watching right now, or all the kids who've grown up, how well did that parenting work? Let us know in the comments. I'm willing to bet it created a little bit of a divide between parent and child, am I right? That's exactly what happened with Queen Victoria. Shouldn't be surprised, really. Being a parent is tough. I get that. But squeeze too hard and the sand falls through the cracks of your hand. Victoria wasn't even allowed an hour to herself. And I don't care who you are, no matter how charismatic or bubbly, everybody needs some alone time. Number two, a healthy breakfast. Okay, not Victorian London, but this is just too funny not to mention, and it's around the same time period, very close. As the great minds of the time thought, self-pollution was a big no-no, and the reason for these urges was often related to food. Some thought eating meat would make you down bad. So a man named John Harvey Kellogg, you might have heard of him, aimed to cure the sickness of self-love. What if a man had a delicious, nutritious meal to eat, especially at the start of his day? Cornflakes by Kellogg's, the, the very same cereal that's probably sitting on top of your fridge, yeah, was partially originally designed to stop you from feeling those carnal urges. Now, not sure if that works, I mean, Go ahead and tell me how you feel after eating a bowl of that. I had one this morning. I feel fine. I don't feel any different at all. I mean, I'm just, well, I'm not really feeling the same about Pam Anderson anymore, though. Number one, rising action. This could get some married couples into some trouble if they're watching. So sorry. It's gonna be hard to talk about this without saying it because YouTube will send a stern letter if I do, but here it goes. The deed was not considered done unless both parties had signed off on it. Uh, had their toes curled, reaching the peak, your magnum opus, the way I feel when I eat at McDonald's, DEFCON 1, 
or simply mispronouncing organisms in health class. I feel like once you're involved, you're involved. And to me, that's a done deal. You can't really reverse it from that point on, regardless of any of my euphemisms. But that's what they thought. They thought if you didn't, you both didn't climb that mountain together, it didn't happen. Because science. Number 10, Boy Jones. What's more intimate than a stalker? Am I right, ladies? If there's one thing women have loved throughout history, it's having every second of their privacy being watched by some creepy man, right? No, I can only imagine it's been worse since the dawn of smartphones and social media. I just, that must be horrible. Well, as it turns out, there were some real creep wads in the Victorian era too. The boy Jones was a stalker of Queen Victoria, who on multiple occasions snuck his way into Buckingham Palace, one time escaping with a pair of the Queen's underwear. What? Arrested multiple times, but still somehow found his way back to the palace. But what they should have done was swap the queen's underwear for a pair of mine after a shift in the garden center I used to work at. Oh yeah, nobody's coming for you after sniffing those bad boys. Oh! Number nine, Shields Arsenic Green. For some reason, green was all the rage back in Victorian times. I'm not sure why. I'm personally not a fan of green, but except for the green screen, we love that. I know you guys can't see that, but I love I love the green screen. When I was as a paint mixer, sometimes people would bring up the wildest colors for me to mix, and they weren't for art projects, they were for walls. So weird, but I digress. There was a common color back then called Shields Green. It was made in a lab by a spooky, scary Swedish guy named Shield. Huh, go figure. This color was used in everything, dresses, fabric, paint, you name it. The trouble is, it was a compound of copper and arsenic. Therefore, it was toxic and caused a lot of harm. It also had links to cancer. For example, when Napoleon was banished to St. Helena, the walls of the house he was staying in were painted with shades of shield. Eee, that's not good. Pretty sure he died of stomach cancer too, so there's a connection there. Number eight, beetle dresses. Like I said, the green color was really in at the time, and there were other ways of achieving such a gorgeous glow besides using shield paint. Similar to how Cleopatra made her eyeliner, some dresses in Victorian times were made with pieces of beetle. Oof. I'm sure there are some folks out there who probably don't mind that, but for the rest of us that don't care for Halloween or My Chemical Romance and Tales from the Crypt Keeper, hard pass. Basically, any beetle or colorful bug that wings or I guess caprices was worth keeping was prepared and sewn into fabric. The finished product doesn't look like it came from creepy crawlies. It actually looks kind of good, to be honest. Mind you, this is a time when a lot of things were still done by hand, so there's a little bit of love in each beetle you stitch. That's kind of nice. Mom, mom helped out with that one. That was nice. Number seven, wearing black for weeks. Losing a family member is tough. Life can get hard. In Victorian times, passing away was a big deal. There was usually a big funeral, flowers, tears, everything, the whole works. The crazy part is, you were expected to wear black or mourning clothes, as they were called, thought to be an outward expression of one's emotions and feelings. However, it's not like that one funeral of the distant uncle you had, where as soon as you got home, you ripped off your suit and hopped on Call of Duty to see what your friends are doing. Oh, on the contrary, my ninja diffusing friends, because in Victorian times, your search and destroy matches would require you to wear those black mourning clothes for a long time, sometimes even weeks and months on end. Queen Victoria wore hers for years after her husband passed, and it was odd to see her in anything but black. That's a weird story. That's crazy. Number six, Annaline Dye. In 1856, William Henry Perkin was trying to create an anti-malaria drug using aniline. After all, the British were spending an awful lot of time in foreign nations doing as the British do and needed a cure to keep doing what they do. Well, he did not find a cure for malaria, but he did discover it makes a very lovely dye that makes deep reds, purples, and black. You need that for the funerals. Naturally, this picked up a lot of steam and began to be used in everything from socks to shoe polish. Yeah. I know, right? Trouble is, once people got enough exposure to the clothing with aniline dyed, their skin would go red, itchy, inflamed, and was known for causing really bad headaches. That's because it would absorb their skin and poison their blood. That sounds pretty <laughs> actually, I don't, I don't want that. Number five, zinc chlorine coats. This one's bad, man, but it was stopped before it became a trend, thank God. Picture this, it's Victorian London and you're but a humble city servant. Your job is to clean the streets. One night it begins to rain, as it is known to do in England. I hear it rains there a lot, I don't know. And the city provides these humble men with coats that have a zinc chloride layer. 
in the fabric. It was supposed to protect against rain and, and wetness and whatnot. A lot of chemistry in this video, but some might already guess that this was a bad idea. Zinc chloride is not only corrosive, but water soluble. So after a shift in the rain, a lot of these men came back with really nasty chemical burns. And no, they didn't have emergency showers like in Heisenberg's RV. They didn't have that. Or your high school chemistry class it was really bad. They stopped it immediately because that's really bad. Number four, asbestos fabrics. Crystal like this, he'll remember these. Picture this, it's 2004. It's Saturday afternoon and your dad just got finished watching an episode of Trucks. Nice. And now you have control over the TV remote. Saturday morning cartoons, here we come. I used to love the Kirby show. He's one of my favorites. Love that guy. But just before you change the channel, there's a commercial with an old man who looks very concerned and he says have you been affected by mesothelioma and or because of exposure to asbestos then you may be qualified for compensation I believe it went something like that maybe I should call Saul Goodman Where's he when you need him? All jokes aside, those commercials were not joking. They weren't joking around at all because it's been known asbestos was very harmful for a long time. So yeah, it was pretty bad. Victorian times were no different. Mostly using things to protect from heat or fire. And while it did do the job somewhat, it was very harmful for the lungs. And like the old man says in the commercial, it could be cancerous, hence mesotheliomia. I, can't, I said it right there. I said it the first time when I was impress impersonating him, and now I can't say it. Mesothelioma. There it is. Mesothelioma. Number three, radium makeup. Okay, sure. I'll give you that radiation and radioactive materials were pretty much being discovered and barely understood for the time. Okay, sure. It was new. Look at Madame Curie. Tragic story there. So when the very interesting radium was discovered, it got thrown into everything because, yeah, why not? Radium makeup, radium watches, you name it, radium was in it. While at first exposure to radium, you'd be fine. Not too much to worry about. However, after years of direct physical contact on the skin, yikes, there's going to be a problem. It's radioactive. It's the reason why you shouldn't get too many x-rays. Not that it's radium, I'm just saying radiation in general is not good for you. Not much to explain in this one, except it was used and manufactured in women's makeup, and they used it. And I, I'm sorry, that's just, that's just rough. Number two, mercury hats. Mercury was nothing new in the medical field in Victorian times. It had been used in ancient China for a long time before that. And yes, it was poisonous. It was harmful to you. However, in Victorian times, some hats included mercury in their production process. Now, why is that so bad? Well, because mercury makes you go insane. Hence why they called it Mad Hatter's Disease. I could not think of a worse name for a disease. Now, not that it's a fashion point, but this was also readily used for treating syphilis at the time. So something that's readily available for the public and health would wind up in closed production. It makes sense. If there's a lot of it, sure, it makes a lot of sense. But it makes people go crazy. That's... Sorry, who's talking to me? What? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> joke, funny. Number one, cellulose nitrate. This one's crazy. As you can tell on this list, there's been a lot of clothes and fabrics mixed with some naughty chemicals. Naughty. Of course, this is years before OSHA or Wemyss, so it probably wouldn't happen today. However, this one takes the cake. When cotton, or a cotton-like product, is introduced to nitric acid, it forms cellulose nitrate, which is also known as flash cotton. Not because it takes its shirt off at an edgy concert, but because I cannot stress this enough how unstable and flammable it really is. Even the slightest heat source could set it off. There's even stories of people spontaneously combusting after being exposed to items made with such. The lights in the studio, they'd probably set it off. That's how, that's how sensitive it is. That's pretty crazy. More sensitive than your first day to prom, you know what I'm saying? Number 10, it's just a cold sore. The Victorian era is cool. The art, the fashion, and technology of the time, I think, are always fun to take a look at, especially since steampunk has its roots in the Victorian era, and who doesn't like steampunk? Come on, there's just a lot of cool steampunk stuff. And honestly, we haven't seen a lot of that in a long time. We need, we need more, we need more. Something not so cool from that era, however, was what you could catch from another person should you decide to take up a bed with another person. Syphilis, yep, one heck of a disease. Funny enough, it was so common that it was making intimacy itself an unusual practice. People were scared, and honestly, maybe rightfully so. There's no cure, and if it progresses to its later stages back then, well, you'd go crazy. And then you'd end up being that guy that's always screaming in the streets. Every city has one. You know what I'm talking about. Number nine, Alexander Graham Bell. I have no idea how phones work. I know it's vibrations and signals and I have to do this occasionally to help it out, but scientifically, 
Nothing. I can't wrap my brain around this technology. Still, I'm 28 years old and I have YouTube. Couldn't tell you. If I was sent back in time right now, I wouldn't beat Alexander Graham Bell. I would just watch him and wouldn't change history one bit. Guy's a wizard. On March 7th, 1876, Alexander Graham Bell received a patent on his invention, the telephone. And just three days later, he made it work. Somehow. The world's first phone call was of course to his assistant, Thomas Watson. Now I'm from the generation that had T9 and I thought that was bad. I also didn't have that, you know, one of these, we have to like go around and around a bunch of times. T9 was way worse than anything. You have to Morse code message all your friends. Ugh, we have it too easy today. Never forget about Alexander Graham Bell. Hit that thumbs up on your smartphone for Alexander Graham Bell. How? How does it work? Hello? Number eight, Queen Victoria's death. You may have heard the phrase, the sun never sets on the British Empire. Sounds very Westeros, doesn't it? Sounds like the British Empire is in an alternate universe or something, I don't know. But this is meant in a literal sense. On January 22nd, 1901, the Victorian era came to a close, of course, after the death of Queen Victoria herself. She passed away at age 81, and Queen Victoria was succeeded by her oldest son, King Edward VII. Now, at this time, the British Empire literally took up more than one-fifth of all of Earth's land. So the sun actually did not set on the British Empire. It's a real phrase. It's not just a fun bit there. Number seven, Queen Victoria's eighth child. First of all, eighth? Kudos. Here's a fact that we don't talk about enough. Let's do this. First of all, I have no idea what it's like to give birth. I hear the comparisons and what it feels like, whatever, and it makes me want to faint. It's like peeing a watermelon or something like that. It's, I'm gonna faint just talking about it. The fact that you can endure this pain is beyond me. And the fact that you want to as well, Kudos. Now imagine being the queen and having the public, like everybody, talk smack about you and how you decide to give birth for the eighth time. Yeah, April 7th, 1853, Queen Victoria decided to use chloroform as an anesthetic delivery. Now everybody at this point that, you know, wasn't a scientist, they were sure to voice their opinions on the matter. It was a huge controversy, although this act directly spread the awareness of this medical advancement. I mean, yeah, it sounds, you know, they're like, yeah, don't do that. But can you do that? We don't really know. We're eating bread. Number six, grave bells. Oh, this one gives me chills. Here we go. In the late 1700s, cholera, bacterial infections, and anything and everything was spreading. It was not an ideal time, wasn't very safe. Many were biting the bullet at this time, sadly, of course, being gravely ill. But with this came a dark trend, the safety coffin. Yeah. Just a backup coffin. These coffins, Lord forbid you are buried alive, these safety coffins would allow the dead to rise again. Nice, like it's Michael Jackson's thriller. They would just come up and be like, oh, ho, ho, guess who's back? Back in the Thames, here we go. All these coffins have extra comfort on the inside and a wire. This wire ran through the coffin and then attached to a bell on the outside, on the you know, ground floor. So if a passerby or heard it, well, thy would know something's up. Folks would get creative with their safety coffins. I mean, you know, they'd personalize it. Like for example, a man named Robert Robinson from Manchester. He passed in 1791, but instructed his family and watchmen to open this special door that would reveal a layer of glass. So that's real haunting to find. Hey, look up like a grandpa. Yeah, he looks good, eh? Patent number 81,437. It was actually granted to Franz Vester in 1868, and it was an improved burial case. Just a glass case with someone who may or may not be alive inside. 50-50. It had an air inlet, a ladder, and of course, a bell. The description of the patent says, if too weak to ascend by the ladder, they can ring the bell, giving the desired alarm for help, and thus save themselves from premature death by being buried alive. So now I ask you, if you're walking in a graveyard and you heard a bell ringing, what, we just could start digging and be like, ah, I think I heard something. I don't know. Let's just disrupt the skeleton. Number five, gym day. Believe it or not, they were around 200 gyms all across Europe during Victorian times. Dudes were getting shredded. Why not? They're like, hey, we don't have dinner, but might as well just work out. These gyms weren't bright. They weren't open. They weren't well ventilated, motivating, safe. None of those things that you need today. No, Victorian gyms were reserved for the upper class. Uh, yes, of course. Grab your pocket watch and your blazer, Ezekiel. We're doing some bench pressing today, I guess. Yeah, grab your monocle for sure. You're going to need that. These machines also, they were not ideal to work out. They were designed as antiques first, rather than, you know, their fitness purpose and safety purpose also. Like, half these look like saw traps. There's no way I'm gonna be bending my arm around any of these Victorian devices. Even the machines today at the gym, I'm like, no way. No thank you. Weak gang, here we go. Number four, 
Beauty patches. Okay, we have to bring back beauty patches ASAP. Imagine like if a rapper had a beauty patch. Nelly had the band-aid, but we gotta have like beauty patches. We gotta like, you know, mix it up a bit. Bring back the facial feature game. These patches came in all shapes and sizes, of course, in the Victorian era. Even in this portrait from 1755, Joshua Reynolds painted Charles, the ninth Lord Cathcart, rocking a large beauty patch. That looks amazing. He does look like Nelly, honestly. He has like that motivational, like rapper kind of like, you know, he, He's, he's in charge, and you can tell from the beauty patch. Like, that's a lord right there with that one of those. Take it off, no lord. Put it back on, lord. The reason for these patches back then, and sometimes having more than one, is because they were commonly used to cover up smallpox scars. They were made out of silk, velvet, and they were applied with glue. So pick a spot and commit. It's gonna be there all day. These patches were dark black, and they were meant to make your pale skin pop. Of course, pale skin back then made everyone faint. Pale, pale skin and long shoes, everyone losing their minds. The position of these patches could also determine your political allegiance. How funny is that? Historian Joseph Addison took note of these positions when he observed two parties from the 1800s. Now one party had patches on the right side and the other had the opposite. It's pretty, pretty amazing. It's a pretty easy way to flip jerseys, right? The other team starts winning, you're like, you know what? Check it out, now I'm on this side, prove it. Number three, chimney sweep. Ah, terrible jobs, here we go. I remember when I was younger, I had to sweep the chimney in the house, and I loved it. I thought it was cool. I thought it was like a little safety, like secret room. I don't know, it wasn't safe at all, actually. It was just a dirty room. Had a little broom, too. I always loved using that little broom. Little tiny sweeps, one at a time. Little tiny bag to go along with it, so gentle. This was a terrible job to have in Victorian London, obviously. Chimney sweeps were famously young as well. I can't say anything else there, but these guys were Young lads, history is horrible. Maybe that's why I was doing it, right? Because I could fit inside of the thing. That makes sense. 1840 was a good year, all things considered. A law was passed that made it illegal for anybody under the age of 21 to climb in and clean a chimney. I was 18 cleaning my chimney. I had no idea. I could have used this great law and got out of the whole chore. Shame. Number two, Jack the Ripper. Unidentified to this day. Who is he? How did he get away with it? And also, when are we going to see a Netflix documentary on this guy? We have everybody else in this multiverse of killers. Where's this guy? Could to complete the image. Well, it's because we didn't find him. Jack the Ripper was active in the East London neighborhoods, primarily, and sadly, he would target sex workers at the time. He famously took the lives of five women from August to November of 1888, and they were believed to have been connected to Jack the Ripper, although some sources claim that he was active until 1891. It's hard to tell who's who and who's doing what. Again, this is also so long ago. There's no cameras. Hard to catch someone. Many believe Jack the Ripper had some anatomical knowledge due to the way that he left his victims as well, which is creepy. While there were some suspects, including a member of the British royal family, believe it or not, Jack the Ripper was never identified, so. Yeah, that sucks, really. We gotta find him. Can't, but we gotta. And finally, number one, mudlarks. Yeah, we'll get dirty for this last one here. Why not? Victorian London around the 1840s, it was a bit of a mess. Everyone was sick, a lot of sore throats, to say the least. The jobs that were available, they sucked. They certainly didn't help you, you know, survive. The jobs that were available had you catching rats and crawling into sewers. One of the worst jobs to have was that of a mudlark. Now, as the name hints towards, a mudlark involved getting in deep in the mud and muck that would build up alongside the Thames River. Yeah, that dirty river back then. They're like, yeah, just go through the, the lining of that. See what's in there. Ugh. This one was reserved, again, for the younger folk with, you know, the, uh, the, the patellas that still worked, you know, digging in the mud, of course. Can't have an old guy in there. He's not gonna come back out. It was like working in quicksand. It was horrible. It was exhausting. Not to mention the chances of being whisked away by the river at any given moment. Yeah, it sucked. All for the slim chance of finding a pocket watch or some driftwood, rags, something, anything really worth your troubles. Number 10, Hathor. The goddess Hathor was originally created by her dad, Ra, as a destroyer of men. She was supposed to punish all those who were disobedient to him. But then, Ra was like, meh. I don't really like that idea. He just kind of changed his mind and decided to make her the exact opposite. Instead, the goddess of love. But she kind of loved killing men and like even he couldn't stop her. So, one night he gave her what was supposed to be a mug of ale but actually made it like a special kind of blood and she got so drunk off of it that she got too tired out to kill anymore and therefore became the goddess of love. 
<laughs> Drunk in love, am I right? Her cult was centered in Dendera, where she was also seen as the goddess of fertility and childbirth. When the Greeks occupied Egypt, they compared her with the goddess Aphrodite. But unlike the voluptuous woman Aphrodite was depicted as, Hathor came in three forms, and I bet you can't guess which. She was depicted as either a woman with a cow's ears, wearing the headdress of a cow, or just a cow. Moo. <laughs> At number nine in our countdown is the Resurrectionists. Money was tight for many, as I had mentioned, but how low are you willing to go as a person to get what you need? Well, if you're willing to dig up somebody's grandma, it could put hundreds in your coin purse. In the early 19th century, the only cadavers available to medical schools and anatomists were that of executed criminals. It was also mandatory for medical students to do an autopsy to graduate, and they had to source their own body. This demand for bodies was often unmet, resulting in medical schools and their students offering extreme amounts of money for the delivery of a fresh body. Thus, resurrectionists are born. Sneaking into cemeteries at night, they would prowl around for a fresh grave site and then dig up the recently deceased. However, bodies could only be sold if they were within a certain time period of freshness. And as grave robbing became more common, many family members of the recently deceased would take turns standing guard for nights in a row to ensure that the body lay undisturbed until it was considered unsalvageable for cash. In 1832, the Anatomy Act was imposed due to the actions of William Burke and William Hare, who are believed to have murdered 16 people between 1827 and 1828, just one year, all to sell to the University of Edinburgh. This act did give doctors and anatomists greater access to cadavers and allowed people to leave their bodies to medical science, overall helping end the resurrectionists era. While sourcing the dead may make for a fat paycheck, I think this is a profession nobody should attempt to resurrect. Speaking of the dead, have you ever considered eating off their lap? Okay, well, not quite literally off their lap, but number eight on the countdown is sin eaters. Sin eating is a job that really only affects you if you have a discomfort with death or a religious slash spiritual. It was believed that when someone religious was to die after a life led of sins, such as gluttony, lust, pride, or crimes and cruelty towards others, their family would sometimes feel that the only way to guarantee their loved ones access to heaven is through someone living taking on the weight of their sins. While the act is against the church's wishes, sin eaters go back as far as the 17th century. Depending on the family or the deceased, the meal served may be specific, but traditionally it was just a piece of bread. Placed on the chest of the laid out body, it was believed to supposedly suck up the sins of the dead, clearing them for a passage to heaven. Once the sins had been captured in the bread, the sin eater would sit on a stool facing the door and eat the bread before washing the bread down with a bowl of ale. Because he was a man who would willingly take on the sins of other people, he was often solitary in the community. However, sin eaters fetched a pretty fair price for the act. I mean, if it is true that you're taking on someone else's bad karma, you'd at least want to be compensated for that, right? Sin eating remained popular in England and Wales all the way to the turn of the 20th century when England's last sin eater, Richard Munslow, died in Rattling Hope in 1906. Like sin eaters, our next job was one of public scrutiny and rejection. Number seven is mudlarking. Victorian mudlarks are the original foragers of the foreshore. They would be scavenging for anything on exposed riverbed which they could sell in order to survive. This was the last ditch resort. People would hike up trousers and wade their feet around in sludge, feeling with toes as well as fingers for items that may be lost or discarded in the mud. All ages participated in this activity. However, it was usually those who were the most affected by poverty that were taking part. As a result, those seen mudlarking were considered shameful and the lowest of society. River Thames was the most famous for mudlarking in the Victorian era, as it was renowned dumping ground that saw endless amounts of product travel through it. It was also a highly impoverished area, which made the desperation to make money all the more grand, filling their water banks with the poor. Mudlarking actually isn't out of practice nowadays, but it has changed significantly. Nowadays it can be a fun group or solo activity that on occasion does require a permit. You can join mudlarking groups or do tours while traveling. It seems that sifting through garbage was an unfortunate trend in the Victorian era as toshers make number six in our countdown. Toshers, a fun word to say, the job, not so much. Unlike mudlarking, which was in the riverbeds, these workers went underground for their winnings. The Victorian era saw the development of sewer systems, and the poor saw opportunity in them. Toshers descended into the sewers to sift through raw sewage and find any valuable that may have fallen down the drains. It was extremely dangerous work, as noxious gas fumes formed deadly airless pockets, and since sewers were newer, the tunnels frequently crumbled from inefficient building. There were swarms of rats that had little fear of humans, and at any moment, the sluices might just open for a fresh wave of filthy water and feces to come crashing through. After 1840, 
1940, it did become illegal to enter the sewers without permission. Rather than abandon the trade, toshers began working late at night or early in the morning to avoid detection. It may have been a stinky job, but it was also one of the most profitable on our list today. I guess you'd go nose blind after a little bit. Right? Hopefully. On a warm summer day, the last thing you want after jumping into the lake on your cabin trip is to emerge covered in leeches. However, in the Victorian era, that would be a prime location for the leech collectors, which are coming in at number 5 on our worst jobs countdown. Leeches are nowadays seen as little more than slimy and creepy creatures, but believe it or not, they used to be a valuable commodity in the fields of beauty and medicines. This job was often fulfilled by poor women living in the country and farmland regions. Wearing shorts or hefting up their long skirt, these women would wade into dirty ponds and waterbeds alike with exposed legs so as to tempt the leeches. When enough leeches were attached to them, the women would climb back out of the pool and scrape the bloodsuckers into metal pots and bowls. Seeing as leeches can survive up to a year without food or in their natural environment, this wasn't always a profitable trade unless you could find someone in dire or consistent need of leeches. Doctors did use leeches to aid in the curing process of all sorts of conditions, ranging from a stomach ache to joint pain to female hysteria, if you know what I'm talking about. Despite being used in medicine, leech collection posed major threats of deadly diseases and blood loss to their collectors. Suffice to say, I don't think I have any interest in going to a doctor's office if I'm going to be prescribed a leeching. Being given the duty of helping prevent and stop the spread of disease in your community would be an incredibly high honor, but maybe wait to sign that job contract until you hear the details. Nightmen definitely make it into our worst jobs countdown, taking the place at number 4. These men would wander the streets at night working what may be one of the most revolting jobs imaginable. Collecting human feces off the street for proper disposal. They would dig up the feces from chamber pots, street wells, ditches, sewer holes, you name it. By the time the sun would begin to rise, the carts would be full of the city's excrement, which would then be carried off and reused as fertilizers for the crop that they later consumed. Yummy. Part of being one of the only people up at night means you're a valuable set of eyes. There are reports of nightmen catching burglars or SA in the act, or being called to bloody scenes by members of the public to provide alibis. There is also hundreds of cases where nightmen are the ones to find bodies of those who had met their ends out on the street. After a long, solitary nights of collecting feces and seeing these crimes unfold, a nightman would collect his 23 shillings, which is $75 today, at the end of the week and go home to rest before starting it all over again. Since we're already discussing dung, let's get this next one out of the way because it somehow may genuinely be a little bit worse than the last. At number 3, this is the Pure Finders. Please do not be deceived by the name because this job is anything but pure. In the Victorian era, tanners, who are leather workers, would use dog dung in their practice. Referred to as pure for how it purified the leather and ensured its soft flexibility, dog dung became a hot commodity due to the Victorian demand for leather. Leather was being used for just about anything as it was the hottest trend of this era. It was also being used for things like tack for horses and the necessary creation of shoes and books. To meet demands, tanners needed more dog dung, and so pure finding became a career. These finders would go deep into the cities and their sewers, trying to find where stray dog packs amassed so they could score the biggest load. Whenever dung was found, it'd be retrieved and placed into a covered bucket that would later be sold to a tanner. To make it a little worse for you guys, only some collectors wore a glove to protect to their dung handling hand. But others considered it harder to keep a glove clean than a hand and they opted out of the protection altogether. Yeah, think about that one. I feel like if this next job didn't exist, then maybe we wouldn't have needed the cat meat sellers from our first point in the countdown. Considered one of the most disease riddled jobs of the Victorian era, it's rat catchers coming in second on our list today. The government was smart. It knew its people were suffering and that many were starving and struggling to make ends meet. So they issued a statement willing to pay people to deal with the rat infestations. Every rat would earn people a little extra cash. If someone could catch more than 5,000 rats in a year, they'd earn special privileges. While 5,000 sounds like it would be a lot, it's essentially 13 per day, and it only takes 21 to 23 days for a rat to give birth to its litter. I think you can do the math. It's said that the government's encouragement of rat catching in this time was the stepping stones towards more plague and diseases to come, as desperate poverty driven people made poor attempts to catch these rats and caught the illnesses from them. Others cheated the rules. Some people actually intentionally bred rat colonies to supplement their captured rodents. Rat catching became such a lucrative business that 
rings formed around it. And murders even took place when the cheaters were discovered or if somebody infiltrated somebody else's ratting territory. Between the venomous competition and high risk of disease resulting in death, it's safe to say that rat catching may have been one of the worst jobs. And now, what may be the worst of the worst for number one slot, let's learn about the history of matchmakers. No, this isn't the romantic kind of matchmaking unfortunately, but it's rather the business of matches itself. Working what was often a 14 hour shift, matchmakers were predominantly women who were immigrants, living in poverty, widowed, just overall in a bad situation for an era where women had pretty much zero rights. They were compensated poorly, often sexually or assaulted by their management, and even forced to pay fines to their workplace should they be tardy or damage anything they worked on. Working with white phosphorus, the material found in the tip of the match to enable the instant strike anywhere effect, was highly toxic and responsible for a devastating disease known as Fossy Jaw. This nickname was given by the matchmakers to the particularly nasty condition that would cause the jawbone to rot and become disfigured. Eventually this infection would spread to the brain and cause debilitating symptoms and extreme pain prior to death. Should the jawbone be removed in time, some women were able to survive longer with the condition, but nothing was guaranteed once Fossy Jaw had set in. Famously, an article written by a matchstick girl named Annie Besant exposed the conditions of matchstick companies in London. Infuriated, the factory owners fired her and attempted to force signatures of their other staff, stating that they were happy with their working lives. Refusing to do so, by the end of day, 1400 women had gone out on strike. Their demands were eventually Met, but only 20 years later. It wasn't until 1906 that white phosphorus was made illegal in the use of matchsticks in the UK. The matchstick girls were a revolutionary step towards the deliverance of women's right and autonomy, a journey that we're still on today. Starting our list off at number 10, the first postage stamp. Uh, uh, uh. Nice, who's the first guy who licked the stamp? Why'd he do it, right? We'll start off with stamp facts, why not? I know there's a couple pen pals out there that still use snail mail, that's cool, this one's for you. May 1st, 18th. 1840, the world's first ever postage stamp was sold, of course, for one penny. Pretty cheap, nice, we love it. The sale changed history. Now, on the stamp was, of course, a portrait of one Queen Victoria, world's first ever profile photo for a letter. Here we go, they're like, oh, who is this? Who's this little person here? Of course, this caught on definitely caught on. More than 70 million letters were sent within the next year. And then that tripled only a few years later. And of course it thrived for 40 years. Do you still use letters? If so, write into us. Write some fan mail. Forget the comments. Write into us with a pen with your autograph too. Where you live. Yeah, no one's doing that anymore. Number nine, the beginning of the world. I Yeah, what, a, what an inventive way to imagine the beginning of things. I mean, the Big Bang is still pretty crazy too, but hey, here we go. Freaking love how much magic is in these stories, like I'm in, because that's all there was at the beginning of the universe according to the ancient Egyptians. Just swirling darkness, chaos, and magic. Heka, the god of magic, was the only thing that existed, waiting for the opportune moment to begin. Then a hill showed up called Ben Ben, and out of which the god Atum erupted from. He was lonely, so he mated with his own shadow to give birth to two children, Shu and Tefnut. Shu gave life, Tefnut gave order. They left their their father to build the world, but they were gone so long he took out his eye and sent it to search for them. In the meantime, he just kind of sat there contemplating eternity all alone. It was really sad. This guy sounds like Zeus mixed with Eeyore. Anyways, his kids came back and he was so happy he wept tears of joy and out of which were born men and women. They also brought his eye back, so that was nice. Number eight, light as a feather. So unlike a lot of religions we've heard of, there wasn't really a concept of hell in Egyptian mythology. It was either you were worthy of heading into the afterlife or you weren't. Mat was the goddess of harmony and supported the belief that if harmony was disrupted, it must be restored. Every ancient Egyptian myth in some form follows this format. But the most important role she played was in the afterlife. When the soul left the body, it would appear in the hall of truth in order to stand judgment before Osiris. The heart would be weighed on a golden scale against Mat's white feather. If the heart was heavier, it would be devoured by a monster and the soul would disappear. If it was lighter, then you could go live in eternal bliss. So instead of several layers of burning torment, souls in Egypt instead faced eternal darkness and unconsciousness. The idea of non-existence was more terrifying than being cut up by demons. Huh. Number seven, Osiris and Isis. Okay, so we aren't strangers to deities being a fan of incest. It was kind of like how they multiplied and ancient Greeks were okay with it kind of 
but they kind of weren't. Anyways, the Egyptian gods were no exception. Isis and Osiris were two of the four children of the goddess of Nut. Isis and Osiris were married and actually really in love. They, they, they dug each other. When Osiris rose to the throne as the eldest sibling, his brother Set was pretty jealous. So he took the life of his own brother, cut him into little pieces, and scattered them all over Egypt. He really wanted to make sure the guy was dead. But then Isis wasn't someone you wanted to mess with. She had great magical powers capable of restoring life. She collected all of the pieces of her brother slash husband and breathed life back into him. Osiris returned to life and they made all the love and then soon conceived a child named Horus. However, Osiris couldn't return to the land of the living, so he had to stay and rule over the underworld. So his son Horus was left to get revenge, and we'll get to that later. Number six, Anubis. Now, I think in West Western films that depict ancient Egypt, like The Mummy Returns, the god Anubis is often associated with the underworld. You know, that creepy half man, half jackal creature who appears to walk out of your nightmares? He's so creepy. Well, he did used to run the underworld until Osiris took over, but he was actually the god of mummification and the afterlife. So not wrong, but not the whole story. Anubis was the son of Nephthys and Set. Well. Kind of. Nephthys actually never conceived the child with Set. She kind of had a she kind of had the hots for Osiris. So she disguised herself as Isis and made love to him that way, and then Anubis came to life. That may have been one of the reasons Seth attacked Osiris in the first place as his suspicions rose. But it was actually Anubis who helped Isis piece together Osiris, creating the first mummy. Fun fact, during the Greek rule of Egypt, Anubis and Hermes were seen kind of as the same. The people who ferried the dead to the underworld. Oh, sorry, and a point. Anubis was actually the one who weighed people's hearts, so he used the feather. The thing, you know what to do. He was responsible for doing that. Number five, Horus and Set. Speaking of Horus, earlier, remember how I said Horus had to take over defending his father? Well, here is where this story begins. When Horus grew up to be a man, he pulled a Hamlet. He was like, You killed my father, prepare to die. Thus, a series of battles ensued, and one of the gods didn't play fair. Set kept cheating at everything and continued to come out as victor. Not surprising since he didn't earn his way on the throne, he killed for it, kind of like a certain Claudius. Eventually Isis stepped up to help her son slash nephew overcome her brother. She set a trap for Set, but after some pitiless begging for his own life, she let him go. Horus was pissed, so angry some of the other gods got upset that he was so angry. They agreed to compete in a final boat race and Horus was like crushing it. He was doing really well, he was about to win. But then of course, Set cheated by turning into a hippopotamus and attacked the boat. Therefore claiming victory once again. Osiris finally showed up and declared that no man should take the throne through murder. So Horus took the throne. Why Osiris didn't just settle the whole deal from the beginning is confusing in itself, but hey, kind of reminded me of the eagles that showed at the end of Lord of the Rings that could have saved like three movies, you know? Kind of like that. Anyways, let's move on. Number four, Ra and his boat. Ra is one of the most revered gods in Egyptian mythology, especially since he was the god of the sun. He was depicted as a man with the head of a falcon. That kind of makes sense. He was once the greatest of all gods, but had to take a step back after he got too old and tired, and especially considering his task, I can see why. His job was to drive away darkness and sail across the skies, delivering light wherever he went. But at night, he would dive into the underworld and have to cross 12 gates. 12 hours, an hour per gate. After paying his respect to Osiris every night, a giant snake named Apophis tried to attack and swallow the boat. Every night! Poor guy, no wonder he got worn out. Every day it got harder to defend, and even one night, Apophis succeeded, but could only hold the sunlight for so long. She threw it up, which explained solar eclipses. After Set was cast out after the whole nephew battle, he ended up serving Ra in his boat and kept the snake at bay. But there's something confusing coming later that I think you'll agree is very confusing. So here we go. Coming up next, we have Bass, number three. Have you ever had a cat look you up and down and kind of like expect something? like worship, you know? Are you a cat person, dog person? Let me know in the comments. Well, that's because cats were a big deal in Egyptian mythology. They even had their own goddess. Bastet was a cat goddess depicted as a woman with a cat's head. Cats had a meaningful role in ancient Egypt as they protected their food from rats and snakes. They were even seen as family members and to harm one was punishable by death. 
Legend says that sometimes cats would enter burning buildings to save their families. If they died, the goddess would bring them back to life, hence the idea of cats having nine lives. There it is. Now here's where things get confusing. You know that story I told about Ra? Well apparently Bastet was in the boat with him as well. During the day she would ride with him, and at night she would turn into a cat and then defend the boat from Apophis the snake. But I thought that was set. So many conflicting things. I saw like a couple different stories who said each thing was different, so who knows. Number two, Jeb and Nut. Yet another sibling partnership, we have Jeb and Nut. They fell deeply in love and could never be separated. They were that couple who would like constantly be like, oh my god, stop, right next to each other at dinner, you know what I mean? Jab was the god of the earth and Nut was the god of the sky. A previously mentioned god, Atum, found their union inappropriate, so he pushed Nut into the sky far away from Jeb. He just didn't like being a third wheel. Jeb and Nut were close enough to see each other, but could never hold each other again. And she gave birth to Osiris. Isis, Set, and Nephthys. Some say Horus too, but I don't think that's true. Number one, the treasure thief. Okay, I don't know how I feel about this story, okay? This doesn't really feel like harmony is in balance, but anyways. The treasure thief ends in a way I really didn't expect and I'm not sure you will either. Long ago, a great pharaoh with a wealth of riches decided to build a pyramid in which to keep them safe. One of the builders was wise to his plan and decided to find a way to claim them for himself. He built a stone vault with a hidden entrance covered by a slab so he could get to the riches. But unfortunately, he fell ill before he could return, so he told his sons of his plan. The sons headed to the pyramid in the dead of night, following the their father's order, but unbeknownst to them, the pharaoh had laid booby traps and one brother was caught in one. Not wanting to be found or interrogated, revealing his other brother, he told his brother to chop his head off. Ugh, that he did. Loyalty? I don't know. The pharaoh upon finding the body hung it up in the town square in the hopes of like weeding out whoever it belonged to. But the other brother being so clever got the guards drunk and stole back his brother's body in the dead of night. The pharaoh was like, I'm not even mad, I'm just impressed. He gave the thief a pardon, summoned him to the square and gave his daughter to marry him. Yeah dude, you tried to steal my jewels? Don't worry about it. Have my daughter, because you're so talented at your job. Great work. Getting us started at number 10 is top hats. A top hat is an iconic image. You can see them in old black and white movies or on logos such as Mr. Peanut. But why were top hats created and why were they so trendy? Well, there's multiple reasons actually. Men and women were already wearing hats and bonnets to protect their heads from rain, wind, and the soot from local smokestacks. As a result, hats were already quite a trendy wear. However, the true reason for its popularity is what it represented. The top hat quickly became symbolic of status, power, and masculinity. From 1850 to 1900, men wore top hats for business, pleasure, and formal occasions. Certain colors were even associated with certain times of day. For example, a black top hat was for day or night, making its wear feel taller, more handsome, even suave. Some were even reported to be a height of 12 to 14 inches tall. Top hats, amongst other hats of this era, also required ridiculous upkeep, such as being brushed, boiled regularly, powdered, etc. They also tend to contain mercury poison. As time progressed, we found other ways to overcompensate as well as accessorize our heads. So it's easier to see why the top hat never made a comeback. Oh. Number 9. Graceful Words this was a time when ladies were supposed to be ladies, and that means manners are on the table and elbows are off. Dresses were worn to not show ankles, god forbid an ankle or wrist bust out. I think more importantly however, or rather unusual that is, is that women were expected to talk a certain way. Good evening Mr. Barrows, you must excuse my tardiness, there was a dreadful man screaming at me because my ankles were shown whilst mounting my carriage. Your what was showing love? Oh you heard of it, I can't believe it, excuse me, I must be someone else. I don't need to tell you guys how ridiculous that is. I say fly out the handle ladies, wear what you want, do what you want. Number 8. Shots. Not the kind I like. Well, I don't know about you guys, but nothing ruins the mood for me and my lady like being fired upon. Yikes. I'd like to stay the night kid, but the automatic gunfire coming from outside is starting to get to me. See? All gangster impressions aside, things must have been that way for poor Queen Victoria as she was shot in her carriage in 1840. A young man fired two shots at her carriage. More attacks would actually follow in the coming years. It's kind of hard to feel that certain kind of way after bullets go grazing past your pretty face. 
The worst thing that ever happened to my generation was making sure nobody was home when you were studying with your boyfriend. I was too busy playing Call of Duty, but at least I never got actually shot at. You know what I mean? That's just a good thing. Number seven, expectations. All right, this one goes out to all the married ladies in the audience. Hello, how are you? I'm doing great, thanks for asking. I'm curious as to why you got married and what your expectations were. Did you marry your high school sweetheart and live happily ever after? Maybe you had a shotgun wedding and after one night at the saloon. Maybe you just really wanted to find a nice man and settle down, start a family, be a mother. I think any of those options are great, so as long as you have options. In Victorian England, you were expected to do the latter. Women were expected to get married and have kids, and that's about it, really. My question is, why were angles and wrists an issue, but giving birth isn't? What I mean is it's kind of a compromising position to be in. All I'm asking is that the girls get treated fairly and given choices and be allowed to show some ankle. This makes any sense. You can look at her business down there, but you can't show an ankle. That doesn't make any sense. I'm a magician. Number six, double standard. Divorce sucks. It's no fun. The person you once loved and cherished is now the villain in your story. I love McDonald's and I don't ever want them to be the villain in my story. I love you guys. Gotta get those Happy Meals. Divorce is something that isn't new. Honestly, it was probably invented the second after marriage was. In Victorian times, men had the right to divorce their wife if they had committed adultery. Women could not. Well, if you refer to my last part, you know that men were doing more than a little window shopping when it came to women. When men left town for business, they would have hired the services of a woman who patrol the streets at night. No, I'm not talking about Batwoman either. So men can divorce women if they dare to do what they did on a regular basis. Yeah, that's that's totally fair, not, yeah, that's good, equal, absolutely, yeah. Number five, emo girl. All the forever alone people, raise your hand. Let me hear you roar XD. I like to joke around a lot and say I'm a lawyer, a firefighter, and the cutest guy on the whole wide internet. But if there's one thing I know, it's people. I like people. I love them. I spend a lot of time with them, and after hearing this, I've come to the conclusion that this is where the emo girls come from. I figured it all out. It's down to a science. I'm a scientist now. Do you ever get that feeling in your tummy on Valentine's Day because you know it's going to be another one alone? And you'll be forced to be on your own, and, and, and that means sad music and crying in your room. Same, it's, it's Drake's Marvin room for me. Well, single women in Victorian times had similar issues. Since women were expected to marry and have kids, single women who were also forever alone were pitied by society, which I argue is just way worse. Who, who, no one wants to be pitied. Ugh. Number four, gold diggers. She take my money when I'm in need. As she drive Okay, anyway, back to the actual content. Well, not exactly. While today in a place like sunny California, you might see an older man with a woman who's half his age. Maybe he's driving a nice car or she's got on the very best and latest from Louis Vuitton. Stylish, yeah. Most of us think some thoughts about what we might think is going on there. We can kind of be judgmental sometimes when we see things like that. However, looking through a lens of 2022 to Victorian times might make the women of Victorian times appear to be gold diggers, but in reality, it was because all of their financials were tied to their husbands, legally too. Which, if you can imagine, that system didn't work too well. What if your husband is broke? What if your husband is running amok with sultry lasses on the street corners? Like I said before, no divorce, but even if she could leave him easily, supporting herself afterwards was going to be an issue, especially financially. Number three, birth factory. Just pump them out. The faster the better. Quantity over quality, just, just get them out. The use of birth control, as you can tell, was not a common practice. Anyone who's over the age of 25, ask your grandparents how many brothers and sisters they have. I'm willing to bet it's in the six to eight range. Let me know in the comments below, I'm curious. A trend that would continue for a few decades after. Education is important, and I'll get to that in my next part. Women were simply expected to act this way. Maybe it was the sign of the times since the Industrial Revolution was in full swing. Maybe the factories needed workers, I don't know. Which, in case you didn't know, they used children as employees. Maybe not so nice. Unfortunately, that was when there was an issue, and there were many. They had no HR to go to, and that was the least of their worries, really. Number two, no school for you. 
No higher education for women. Banned from going to university. I don't think so, not very nice, no, no. Honestly, any society that doesn't want half of their population to go to school probably has a few things to work out. It's a boys club and they can only go to university so that they can learn to be smarter and be businessmen so they can earn money and thus have the facilities to court a woman who really doesn't have a choice anyway. Women had jobs, not careers. And they were all the jobs that you can think of. The ones that were too feminine for men as women were too feeble to participate in a men's job, which is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. I'm happy to say that in 2022, we showed them wrong. Chetty loves everyone. Just remember that, I love everybody. You go, girls. Number one, strict rules. Okay, so after a night in the bed sheets with the gal that you love, or maybe the one that you found, there's a good chance that nine months later, a smaller version of you two could be walking around. A byproduct of intimacy, if you will. This was always something I wanted to rant about, but I always found it strange how strict parents and teachers from this time were with their kids. You gotta brush your hair, bed made, and whatever you do, don't ask for more gruel. Please sir, could I have some more? Whatever that Charles Dickens book was, I think it was Oliver Twist. They made us read those books as kids, and I don't know why, because they're kind of boring. From the extreme military code ethics happening at home to the long days in a factory at work, being a kid was tough, man. Earning the punk rock blues of today. I'm just a kid and my life is a nightmare. Number 10, the cholera belt. This is just so silly to me. While the Victorian era seems like a long, long time ago, it's really only like three to four people ago. So yeah, your, your grandparents or maybe even your great grandparents could have experienced a life like this. As we all know, disease was rampant back then and thank God we're a little less gross now, am I right? Well, cholera was quite the tummy bug going around back then, causing upset stomach indigestion and the Oregon Trail's favorite, diarrhea. Ooh, no thanks. So the people of Victorian times came up with something that, well, wasn't only functional, but fashionable too. Very nice. The collar of belt was a piece of red fabric that was to be wrapped around the belly to keep you warm. That's because people thought having a cold belly caused cholera. Because yeah, that's, that's, that devil gives you cholera. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. That's what it does. It's not. It's a, it's a sickness. It's a virus. Number nine, the French letter. The issues of intimacy and its repercussions were becoming quite clear in the Victorian era. Something had to be done, as spending any amount of time in the brothels could have you shucking barnacles off your lower deck in the morning, if you know what I mean. Introducing the revolutionary new invention, prophylactics. For those that are college age, you might find it disturbing that these party favors weren't made of rubber or disposable. Yeah, hear me out. They were made of sheep's guts and they had to be soaked first so they would become flexible because when you put these bad boys on, they had to be fastened on. It's not very good, not very attractive. Once the deed had been signed off on, the device was then washed and then hung up to dry like your dirty laundry. Once it was dry, it was placed in a small box for the next time because seeing your wife's ankles might make you feel a certain kind of way and now you just have it ready to go. And Number eight, the products of our sins. Having fun when the lights can be turned off is great. Who doesn't enjoy a little toe curling, yeah? Except sometimes there's this crazy thing that can happen where after nine months, another human spawns in. Insane, right? I know. Well, back in the Victorian era, this phenomenon was happening, but only for married couples, as you have to be married, of course, or else a child would be born out of wedlock, which to people at the time was just the worst. Oh, I never. These stigmas were not favorable for women as some preferred to avoid that kind of press by abandoning or straight up just unaliving their children. Horrible, just, just horrible times. Just another one of those good old wholesome times in history where we were treating women with the utmost respect and decency. Very nice. We were actually not very nice. Number seven, diet. Bedroom misconduct was becoming a huge issue. Refer to number nine and 10. While women did get most of the blame because, well, you know, history, men did get some of the blame. The issue of intimacy for men could be described as barbaric primal sense. So how do we curb this? How do we stop men from acting on these caveman urges, ooga booga? Well, simple really. Men just have to stop eating certain foods as it was thought at the time that food had a link to the misconduct or rather the overabundance of bedroom related issues, including mustard, pepper, rich gravy, beer, wine, cider, and tobacco. And if you weren't paying attention, that's basically the diet of every man in Victorian times. Not sure how a jar of finely prepped mustard would get you flustered, but okay, sure. The beer makes sense though, you know, have a few beers, and even the mop leaning over the corner looks pretty lonely, and 
Boy, that mop has lovely hair. Number six, job market. Ladies of the evening, women of the night. Women who make beds go bump in the night. They were everywhere in Victorian London, a lot. It's partially related to some of the points I previously mentioned. Now, I'm not here to say it's necessarily a bad thing. Personally, I don't think it is. As they say, it's the oldest profession in the book, with an estimated 80,000 women working in the night by the late 1890s. You'd have to be crazy to miss that. I mean, they, they were literally everywhere. With numbers like that, there's something for everyone and in varying price ranges, as they can be found in brothels or townhomes set up by the wealthy men for their mistresses, pretty much anywhere trouble likes to spawn. Even some artists took advantage of this by living with the gorgeous girls of the evening, as going behind closed doors with one was debatable, but becoming friends? Now that's a social transgression. That, oh, becoming friend, oh, how dare you befriend the people of the night. Number five, Jolly Lad. When people think about certain magazines that depict lewd imagery, you probably only think of Playboy. The bunny imagery was good marketing, honestly, just, just smart. But what if I told you the Hefmeister wasn't the first to publish such a magazine or imagery? Back in the Victorian era, there was some saucy imagery being produced. The government had outlawed such indecency, but this only made the lewd picture industry move underground, where naturally it flourished, especially in major cities. And if you knew where to go and and how to ask for one, you could purchase something from the hidden menu. Kind of like when you go to McDonald's. Yeah, there's a hidden menu there too. Google it and see for yourself. I'd repeat what my favorite one is, but I would be in trouble from the YouTube gods. And I've been treading on thin ice this whole video, so. Uh... Number four, the first counterculture. The 1960s were a very important time for many different people. Black Americans were fighting for the rights, music went from holding hands to strawberry fields, if you know what I'm saying, and everything that your parents told you just, just kind of felt wrong. If you grew up then, you know what I mean. I know people like to make fun of hippies, but there was some good ideas there. Well, in 1890s England, they were sort of having the same thing happen. Obviously, not as strong as a push as it was in the 60s, but still. Basically, after all the oppression towards bedroom relations, people began to open up. Uh, not literally, just, just open up thinking-wise. That's really gross, don't repeat that. There's only one way we all got here. Unless you're a test tube baby, of course. In that case, thank you for watching CT133576-2. To some historians, this makes sense. When you push and push for things to happen or ban, eventually people will push back, especially if it's something like bedroom time. Everybody, everybody likes a little bit of bedroom time. Valentine's Day wasn't too long ago. Remember that? It was good. It was fun. It was good, good fun. Number three, Jack the Ripper. While the man's numbers don't compare to any of the other horrible people in history, he's unusual because of his brutality and the fact that he was never caught. Jack the Ripper was maybe the first modern serial on a liver. He haunted the streets of Victorian London and is responsible for claiming multiple women's lives, women of the evening to be exact, and they began to know the name Jack the Ripper. Now, we'll probably just have to show you pictures of Victoria London or maybe some B-roll of a shadowy figure because there ain't no way we can show the crime scenes. There's probably a dozen different theories on who done it. Some say it was multiple men using his name as an alias. Some say it was Prince Albert. There's even some who suggest that he was a she, and which explains why women were so easy to go off with Jack. That actually kind of makes sense to me at least and why no one really would be looking for a woman back then. Kind of makes sense. Anyway, be careful out there, ladies. Just, just be careful. Number two, Queen Victoria. It seems old blight herself may have been a tad more promiscuous than you'd think a royal to be. Well, not with other men, but her husband, who in her diary claims to be the love of her life, which honestly is kind of sweet and, and romantic. That's nice. One thing that I find interesting, however, is that while lewd images were outlawed, the queen may have commissioned a painting of herself that was quite risque for the time. To gift to her husband, of course. Hypocrisy much? I say lewd, but it was probably just in her loose fitting clothes with maybe like an ankle show on or something. Still, unusual behavior for the queen. I'll remember that the next time, Blight. I'll remember that. Number one, Prince Albert. If you've ever stepped foot into a tattoo parlor, then you might know where I'm going with this. Prince Albert, the husband of Queen Victoria, had some controversy circulating his name. One, because he shares a name with another Prince Albert, who was speculated to be Jack the Ripper, but also because of a very unique piercing. Go ahead and take a guess where that piercing is. Yeah, I didn't think so. As a man, if your anatomy could be described by an internet comedian using moderately funny euphemisms, then the piercing would go through your German army helmet. That makes sense, right? The horror, the absolute horror. It's rumored that he had one of these piercings. Did he? I, I'm not sure. But if it means anything to you, Nicholas II had a tattoo, so it's not completely out of the realm of possibility. 